are at 1.30, and I do believe we have a quorum. Uh, I was messaged by uh, Vice Mayor Jones. He's running late from another uh, committee, so he'll be a little late. But um, we'll go ahead and call to order uh, this meeting of the Public Safety Finance and Strategic Support Committee uh, on February 18th. If we can get a roll call, please. Perales? Here. Jimenez? Present. Mayhem? Here. Arenas? Arenas? Okay, we have we do have a quorum. Thank you. And uh, we'll go to review of the work plan. Do my colleagues have any items they'd wish to have added, dropped, or staff? Seeing none. Um, if we can get a motion to approve the work plan. So moved. We have a motion. Second. There we go. Thank you. We can get a roll call vote. Perales. Aye. Jimenez. Aye. Mahan. Aye. Arenas. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And then now uh, we have nothing on consent, so we'll go right to our uh, regular agenda. Um, item D1 reports from committee. This is our firefighter safety systems in high rise buildings report. And I believe we have the chief with us. Welcome chief. Good afternoon, Robert Sapien, San Jose Fire Department Fire Chief. Thank you for having me. Uh, today's item, uh, firefighter safety systems in high rise uh, buildings. Uh, on October 21st of 2019, council directed uh, the fire department staff to uh, evaluate uh, whether uh, an alternative to FARS or firefighter breathing air systems, you'll see that in the memo as FBARS, um, whether an alternative such as fire rated elevators will provide at least better or better safety to firefighters and residents in high rise buildings. Uh, currently, FBARs, or Firefighter Breathing uh, Air Replenishment Systems, are required uh, in high-rise buildings, uh, in structures with two or more floors beneath grade or underground, uh, tunnels that are greater than 500 feet in length, or where emergency vehicle access points are further or greater than 150 feet from the nearest entrance to the building. Um, currently, uh, we have uh, 98 high-rise buildings in the city, 11 uh, have FBAR systems installed, uh, 13 others uh, under construction where FBAR systems will be required, um, and plans submitted for 39 others where systems will be required as well. Uh, there are 87 existing buildings that do not have uh, FBAR's installations. Um, what you see here are uh, fire service access elevators and the notation uh, says that fire service access elevators were added to the California Building Code in 2010, requiring buildings with an occupied floor of more than 120 feet above the lowest level of fire department vehicle access to provide a minimum of one fire service access elevator. Uh, in 2013, the section was modified to require no fewer than two fire service access elevators with a capacity of not less than 3,500 pounds each. And so uh, the fire, the California Building Code does require fire service access elevators. Um, what are FBARs or FAR systems? Uh, so they would be the uh, cabinetry uh, used for filling uh, air bottles on the fire ground. Uh, it would include the uh, piping or plumbing uh, to provide air to various locations uh, of the building. Uh, and in uh, figure one or the photo number one, you can see that they require uh, fire department resources or apparatus to supply air to the systems uh, on, uh, in the event that we employ them. Um, Breathing air support is a required uh, function of high-rise firefighting. 
Currently, uh, we achieve this uh, by policy because again, most of our high rise uh, inventory does not include firefighter breathing air replenishment systems. Uh, and so we port uh, our air bottles uh, to uh, an area, two floors, generally two floors below the fire floor and we maintain logistical support to ensure that air bottles are filled and available uh, to support ongoing operations. Uh, again, our fire department SOPs uh, plan that exact way, which is to port bottles uh, as needed because most of our inventory does not uh, have FBARs available. Um, to answer the, the primary question posed by, can by council, uh, the FBAR systems and fire service access elevators are not functionally equal. And so there cannot be equal, um, e equal safety margin. Uh, and the, the more difficult one to add is safety for uh, residents um, in, in comparing the two options. Uh, FBARs uh, does reduce logistical support needed uh, for providing breathing air in high-rise fire operations um, and fire service access elevators can support movement of personnel and equipment, including SCBA cylinders. Um, to, to simplify uh, all of this, I will tell you that uh, if, if I were presented with high-rise structures that offered all of the regular systems, including alarms, sprinklers, standpipes, uh, stairwells and offered FBAR systems, I would probably operationally still long for fire service access elevators. Uh, given the opposite proposal, if we had all of the, the normal high-rise systems and had fire service access elevators, I would probably say that we could function effectively. Uh, I believe the question posed uh, to me last time uh, at this committee was, um, uh, a question about uh, having FBARs available as a tool uh, and would it be uh, valuable to our operations? And, and as I said then, the answer is yes. Uh, we're an organization that's dependent on tools. And so uh, the more tools we have at our disposal, uh, I think we, we are more comfortable in our operations. Um, with that, uh, I will... Uh, be open to questions. Thank you, Steve. Um, we'll go over to the uh, public first, public comment. And I'm uh, sorry if uh, you are speaking from a member of our public and you're on Zoom with us today, if you can use the raise hand function. And, um, and if you are calling on the phone, you can use star nine uh, to raise your hand and then star six to unmute. Okay, first up. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, uh, Chief Sapien, for that uh, analysis and for the work that you do for uh, our city. Um, my questions regard that you stated that uh, 120 feet, you would have to augment the current infrastructure of a building at 120 feet. So that's like a threshold. So what my question is, is that the buildings that are going up now are twice that size because 10 feet is mas o menos uh, one floor. So now with that said, what my question is to the city is what have the city done in order to fortify the infrastructures of the, of the fire department so that they can do their job? What I mean by that is that have the developers been charged to augment the city's infrastructure with respect to the fire departments to accommodate those buildings? So the other example is that, um, not to be morbid, but the chief anticipated that we eventually, at some point, are going to have a high-rise fire in one of those buildings. Let's say the 22nd floor. Most of them are 24, second, 22nd floor. The infrastructure in terms of the trucks, we don't have trucks right now available to reach that height. 
Okay, so that's another element that what have the developers helped the city with in order to ensure that we maintain that infrastructure so that we're not subsidizing these buildings via fortifying the city with the infrastructure necessary in order to deal with those kinds of issues. You came to the city to build it? Well, then you know what? You come to the city and also fortify the infrastructure that is necessary in order to keep that building safe. So the, those are my questions and uh, look forward to a, a, a good discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next up is Blair Beekman. Thank you. My Zoom may cut out, I guess, uh, to prepare yourself. Um, yeah, I'd like to second Paul's words. Uh, uh, you know, what do we do about the future of building and why are we cutting corners? Why are cutting corners being allowed uh, for, for, for this sort of uh, subject matter? Um, I, you know, I feel it's time that uh, you know, I, I hope you can allow me to describe that. Uh, it's my personal feeling that, uh, you know, uh, you know, I do a lot of my work based on the uh, what the events happened at uh, the time of 9-11. And um, I think we are all learning, you know, how to better talk about what exactly happened at that time. And it's pretty frightening to consider. And it's pretty frightening to consider what we do to each other within this country and uh, what the lengths we will go to uh, and what 9-11 happened and what exa exactly happened. So it's important my work tries to create an openness that uh, you know we can talk about issues better and we can just simply come to agreements about how to work and behave, <laughs> basically. Um, so, you know, it's, it's that, sort of efforts that I'm hoping that, uh, you know, this all comes back to the ideas of cutting corners and cutting costs. And we don't want to work towards our better ideals and better practices that, you know, the police chief, the fire chief here has to make up to. And we have to go through a whole bunch of different steps now that I think things would be a lot easier if, uh, future developers want to put into the pot a bit more about our decency and our good practices. So thank you. And uh, thanks for the words of Paul Soto as well. Great, thank you. And now we have uh, Captain Mike uh, Dugan. Hi, uh, my name is Mike Dugan. I'm a retired captain from the New York City Fire Department. I was at the 9-11 attack. And I was also at the attack on February 26, 1993, where the bomb went off in the basement and the elevators were destroyed. And I walked personally 50 stories. Other people walked more than that. They walked 110 stories. Um, we got up about 10 floors and we started leaving stuff on every other floor. We couldn't do it. And this was back in the day without bunker gear. It was three quarter boots. And we had to take our boots off and put them around our neck. My question is, uh, if we're taking away something that is a firefighter safety and a resident safety system, what else can we take away? Who gets to decide which things we leave? Do we take the standpipes out and go back to the bucket brigades? Do we not increase our pump size to pump up the standpipe in these extremely large buildings that we're allowing to be built? We're putting the occupants up in these places and we have to get out there. You can look at the history of the fire service. You can look at one Meridian Plaza. You can look at a couple of others where things go wrong. And when they start going wrong, they go wrong big time. And it's a snowball effect. And I just think that, you know, who gets to choose what we do away with? Is it the developers? I think the firefighters and the union wants these systems because they're a secondary system and they also increase their manpower because people aren't tied up moving bottles. And I just think that it's a shame that we have to uh, fight for this all the time. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. I don't see any other members of the public wishing to speak at this time. Never mind. Um, so we have uh, next up, uh, Captain Mike, uh, I believe it is, sorry, it went away on my screen. Uh, Captain Mike uh, Gagliano. Uh, 
Can you hear me, Raul? Raul, I know it's a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> yep, we can, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, my, my name is uh, Mike Galliano. I'm a retired fire captain out of Seattle Fire, and, and I do appreciate um, being able to speak to the subject of FARS. I would like to address one thing that the fire chief said, and he was accurate in his description of the elevators only being able to take the bottles two floors below the fire. And I hope that didn't get past everybody because you saw the challenges that the firefighters face having to strap those bottles over their necks with straps and what have you. I want you to think about the citizens above that fire, not just the firefighters. That elevator, if it works, and in a good many of the high-rise fires that have happened nationally, the elevators have failed. They've stalled, they've trapped firefighters in them, and the bottles have got to be carried from the ground floor all the way up, sometimes while the firefighters are breathing air. All of your citizens, all of the people that are voting for you, they are above that fire wanting firefighters to get up there and to be successful getting up there. We have to have air. We have to have air and we have to have water. If that elevator only goes two floors below, which is standard policy, you cannot go past the fire floor, the bottles still have to manually be hauled up. So if the fire is on 10, the bottles have to be hauled up an additional 10, 15, 20, 30 floors. And as Captain Dugan reiterated earlier, it's a, it's a fantasy. The firefighters are gonna be so exhausted, they're gonna be dropping gear all the way up. I would encourage you in this, to do the job we need to do, we need air and we need water. We would never consider eliminating the standpipe system and cutting that off two floors below where the fire is and then having to haul water up. I would ask respectfully that you continue to lead the nation. San Jose Fire is one of the leading departments in the nation on having FARs in place. To allow it to be stolen would be a real detriment, not only to your fire department, which is trying to give you their best, but also to the citizens who are desperately hoping we're going to get up there and provide them life safety. Thanks. I appreciate you listening to me. Thank you, Captain. Next up is Deborah Hall. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm Deborah Hall. I'm the Deputy Director of the Firefighter Air Coalition. We're a group of individuals from industry, government, and the fire service, and we advocate for air management best practices, of which FARS is one. I am just letting you know that I'm on the call, and if there are any questions, I'm here and we'll try to answer them. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention on this matter. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and next up, we have a uh, speaker uh, with the name Chris. Hi, uh, Chris Murphy, uh, Local 230. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I just want to let you know that I, I too am on the phone uh, having some technical difficulties with my phone. But if anybody has any questions of, of Local 230, I think we made it a, apparently clear in the past that uh, we we look at this uh, equipment as, as vital to the uh, uh, safety of the citizens of San Jose and the, the firefighters as well. Uh, just, just anecdotally, if you were to do a Google search right now uh, and look up a high-rise fire, uh, the first thing that comes up is uh, a recent fire in Los Angeles City, where they threw uh, 300 plus firefighters at this fire for, for several hours to extinguish it, and still 15 people were transported uh, to the hospital, I believe, or roughly 15, including, I think, three firefighters. San Jose will be lucky to get 90 fires excuse me, 90 firefighters to the scene of a, of a high-rise fire on the initial attack. And even that'll take some time to assemble. Anything above and beyond 90 will require mutual aid. So if we get a fire that's extended uh, inside of a high-rise building where there are people trapped, we're gonna need uh, a lot of resources and that will take hours to, to assemble. If we are already starting, uh, uh, to fight this fire being handicapped by our poor staffing model in San Jose. And you throw on top of that now the need to figure out how to, how to get firefighters air to breathe to fight the fire. Um, that's that's gonna be a, a huge problem. And uh, uh, some some people could could pay the ultimate price. So um, I urge the uh, the uh, council members on the Piss Fist Committee to, to give this serious consideration and, and know that your firefighters are asking you to allow this uh, equipment to stay in the uh, San Jose Municipal Code and to, to give us an extra margin of safety. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Okay, and that concludes our speakers from the public. We'll now go back to my 
too many colleagues. And uh, we'll go to Councilmember Adenas. Hey, Councilmember, you're on mute. Sorry, I did not stop you sooner. <laughs> I was just saying, my internet is shoddy. Uh, obviously, it's not just my internet, it's also my ability to unmute myself is shoddy. So um, I apologize if, if my picture comes up, um, that's just so that I can stay connected. So really what I wanted to say, I'm not gonna change really my position from what I've uh, already declared before. I see the, the benefit to the, the FARS uh, system. I see the cost, you know, the cost is absorbed in the developers as they are building uh, the building. Um, and uh, it's, it's a reliable um, uh, system that we, We've heard many folks just testify once again in in supporting that. Uh, uh, on the, and and I think about you know I think the rough cost is about two hundred thousand, right? And when I um, compare it to what we have to do for the FSAE, I think that's the acronym um, for the elevators. Um, it, it's not just the elevators because it, you know it's just this uh, elevator that I think it's just reinforced and and has some additional cost to it so that it it um, um, it, it could I guess uh, uh, fend off some fire um, but it's used for personnel or whatever it's used during the week it's not just exclusive for uh, uh, fire purposes and so one of the things that I think about is mm, what is that additional cost going to be for the city of San Jose when there is a fire and from what I understand um, that's personnel costs. So if we relied on the elevator system, the FSAE system, then we would have to, when there, there is a fire at a high rise building, take um, firefighters from, <clears throat> from other sites, take them away from calls so that then they can then supply um, these air, you know, the, these bottles um, uh, so, so that we can have so that the firefighters can have uh, air supply on a continuous basis. And so for me, I see that as the city of San Jose and the taxpayers subsidizing this alternative that I just don't, that, you know, I don't see the benefit to it. Um, I, I don't know that we have to fix anything that's broken. Um, the only thing that I think that needs to now get integrated as we move into a, a new site, a training site, is to see if we can get a FARS um, system set up in one of the in one of the practice towers, um, and then some ongoing training for our fire department would be the things that I would look for. Um, and if there's anybody from the rescue air systems, I think I heard Tony um, uh, on the line, and just to affirm maybe the support for our fire department so that it doesn't cost the city of San Jose anything extra either. Thank you. So, Chair, could could we have uh, Tony then confirm uh, that this is something that they might be able to um, support, which is um, have whenever that is going to happen thereafter. I am, uh, I guess, a little confused on who Tony is. I know that we had. Um, he is from the, I jotted his name down. He's from the rescue air systems. Okay. I thought we had Deborah Hall. Um, I see her raising He's her from hand. From uh, Firefighters Air Coalition. It doesn't matter, no. whatever, well, whoever can answer the question, it doesn't matter okay. to me. Sorry, yeah, to, to, we're, we're fine to go over to Tony. I don't see any, uh, there might've been a caller in, but we don't have anybody titled Tony on the, the um, attendee list. And so I don't know if, if um, did you get his last name? Hi, this is Tony Taylor. Tony, um, there is an Anthony listed on the attendee side. Okay, that, that might be him. Uh, if it's Turi Turiello, um, I'm sure I'm not saying that correctly. We have we it's have just, unmuted I, you. Yeah. Uh, Tony, go ahead. Yeah, well, hi, it's uh, Tony Turiello with Rescuer. Thanks for uh, giving me a moment. Um, on, on the training side and the, the training tower that the council member raised, that would be more for the firefighter Air coalition. Um, I think Deborah is on the line for that. She can, she can speak to, to that training tower 
and the training opportunities there. Um, I join more for any kind of technical questions that may, may come up, historical quest or technical. So if, uh, if they have any of those questions, I'm here. If not, I'll just drop my hand and let uh, the Firefighter Air Coalition take over. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you about that. And sorry Thanks. for the mix up. Um, That's the, it. We're going just off of what the titles are and the names here. So uh, Deborah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now hear you. Okay, great. Um, thank you for the opportunity. So uh, just to let you know, um, we've had an offer of a FAR system for your training tower on the table since the first FARS installation in San Jose, and that offer remains on the table. Uh, we know you're getting ready to build one. We can put one in the current tower. We can move it to the new tower. So there is absolutely no problem. We have a grant system uh, through the Firefighter Air Coalition, and we've actually done this with a number of cities, Phoenix, uh, Glendale, Arizona, which is important because that's the regional training center for most of Arizona, uh, Tempe, Nashville, uh, the University of Maryland, uh, the Maryland Fire and Rescue Institute there, San Francisco, um, in Texas, we're now working with Dallas, Plano, McKinney, and Grand Prairie. Um, all of these are grants of, of our systems for their training towers. So um, we've gotten pretty good at it. So uh, we do a lot of that. Um, in terms of uh, training costs, we, um, we also have done some grants to underwrite training in certain cities. Um, typically, we sit down with the fire department so that we understand your staffing levels and your training needs, and, and that is something that we can also commit to from as a FAT grant, um, but we, we just need some further information on that. Wonderful. Well, you know, I, I think at this point, it's, it's part of the, um, the department to connect with Deborah. Um, and sort those those um, items out. But I, I love that you're continue to be committed, uh, Deborah, to this FARS system um, at our training center and ongoing trainings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, does that conclude your uh, comments, Councilmember? Yes, uh, so motion to approve. Okay. Um, let's check here. Second. We have a, a motion and a second, um, and I'll ask for clarification after, but go, I'll go ahead to uh, Councilmember Mahan. Thanks, Chair. Um, just quick question, probably for the Chief. I just wanted to better understand the personnel implications of not having the system available. It, it, my understanding from the memo is if, if there's a fire in a high rise, we're looking at 90 or 91 firefighters uh, being sent there in that first response wave and that there's a, a um, implication uh, for how many firefighters are actively able to fight the fire versus supplying air and just wanted to get a better sense of what that cost is that we would bear if, if we did not have this system. So uh, operational costs would uh, be incurred outside of our existing budget. Um, I, I think only if we requested mutual aid for extended periods beyond um, uh, an initial firefight. So we, we shouldn't see an increased. Uh, an I didn't actually mean financial cost. I'm sorry. I meant in terms of the number of um, personnel you're able to have doing the optimal work of putting out the fire. My understanding is without a fire system in, you have more firefighters who have to carry air up. And so I'm curious how much it ties up your resources on site if that system isn't in place. Okay, yeah, so we, we, uh, we have standard dispatch procedures that would um, essentially dispatch a, what we call a level three or a third alarm fire to a, a working high rise uh, fire. Um, that level three resource load would be that 91, 92 folks that, that we spoke about. Uh, right. Just FYI, there are 186 firefighters on duty daily in the city. Uh, if we did draw down 90 firefighters, we would be, we would likely be uh, enlisting mutual aid support uh, in a fire that was that involved. Um, so, so the system would work, uh, have to work beyond uh, San Jose's borders to support a, a fire that size. Uh, in, in, as I 
hopefully explain clearly in the memo, uh, because we have 87 plus buildings that are high rise structures without FAR systems included, our standard operating procedures presume uh, that we do not have FARs available. Uh, secondly, because we do have to provide a, a breathing air support unit to supply the system before we can utilize them, that's another reason we keep our SOPs the way they are because you, you can't necessarily rely on a single vehicle to be available to support your operations. And so we, we presume, uh, we, we set ourselves up so that we, we won't fail to have air bottles available. Right, but, but in a case where you're not relying on this technology or you're not able to, what is the cost in terms of the 91 firefighters on the scene, how many of them then have to be involved in transporting air? So the, the simple statement would be, if, if we're relying on a filling station at an upper floor through uh, FBARs, our logistical support or our stel stairwell support unit, it would still exist, but we would likely assign fewer resources to it. So it okay. could be, I, I think a good estimate would be three companies. So, so possibly 12 personnel fewer uh, to support stairwell support. We still have other tools and equipment, uh, evacuation operations, uh, all kinds of stuff going on beyond air bottles. Uh, but the burden would be just a bit less without having to, to port air bottles. I see. Okay. Okay. Thanks. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. that, that was the only question I had. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I don't see any other questions or, or, hand, or excuse me, hand raised from my colleagues. Oh, uh, Vice Mayor Jones. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chief, uh, I'm sorry I missed your um, initial presentation, uh, but were you recommending to keep our current uh, guidelines and ordinance in place, or are you recommending making the change? Or I just want to understand um, what your desire is. So I am not proposing a change. Uh, my, my direction was to evaluate, uh, again, whether we could uh, find a, a method to provide equal safety to firefighters or equal or better uh, protection for residents in lieu of FBARs. And the example I was given was fire service access elevators. Um, I, I don't think the systems are similar enough to say that I can, I can find an equal um, to FBARs. In other words, elevators are not an equal. Uh, they do two completely different things. Um, my uh, synopsis earlier was that given two scenarios, one scenario being if, if you, if, if not you, but if, if, if we all had buildings with alarms, sprinklers, standpipes, and stairwells, and only FBARs, I would probably still be longing for fire service access elevators. If the question were reversed, uh, where we had all of those things and only fire service access elevators, I think I would fall where the California building code currently is, which is I think we could function effectively uh, in that circumstance. Um, I also uh, recalled the question, I believe it was council member Perales that asked last time, if we had the uh, available tool of FBARs, would it be of value? And my answer is still yes. Any tool that we have at our disposal uh, to support our operations can be valuable. Again, my task was to simply answer that question of, of can we provide equal or better um, uh, safety uh, with a different system than uh, FARS. Okay. And then uh, my next question is, if we accept uh, your report, wh what are the next steps? Where, where do we go from here to, to arrive at wherever we're going to land in terms of the ultimate solution? So I, I think I, I would be guided perhaps by the chair. Um, the question before me was, was that simple. I, I, and my conclusion ultimately was, uh, if we had fire service access elevators, 
we could op we could operate effectively, uh, but I I won't say that we are in fact providing equal or better uh, systems than we would without both systems in place, right? So I, I think it's really um, with that answer. Uh, I hope I've provided council with the opportunity to um, perhaps give direction on on what we want to do. Um, I again, I'm not proposing a, a change. Okay, so I, I uh, seconded uh, Council Member Reyes's motion for one reason. I didn't want to leave her hanging, but I'm still not totally clear in terms of do you want additional um, input and direction? And I, I'm leaving it up to the experts. You know, you. Um, the other fire personnel and the other experts to uh, to give us that guidance. So I'm still, you know, and maybe Chair, maybe you can help me out. I'm still a little fuzzy in terms of what the next step or what that direction should be. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that to. That made some sense. You did. I was gonna, <laughs> after uh, Councilmember Dennis made her motion, that's why I said I, I would actually try to help clarify, I think. Okay, what I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, and I do, I do wanna make sure I'm crystal clear because I don't wanna leave concute. Uh, confusion. So evaluation of follow-up in the, in the original memo was that it, it says acceptance of this recommendation will require city council approval to amend uh, charter 17.12 of the San Jose Muni Code, allowing designated fire service access elevators as an alternative to FBARs uh, for high-rise buildings uh, and will be included on the September 8th. We're, we're well past that city council agenda. That is intended for your and council's consideration. Um, I don't think acceptance of this memo was intended to direct that we would change uh, the code. I, and I agree. Um, I think the municipal code is, stands as is, and unless the council directs a change. So this is just this was informational analysis to determine if there was an alternative as, as the chief described and and um, unless the council you know the committee wants to forward a different rec a recommendation that changes the municipal code it would stand as is as I look at let, let me also clarify here the the agenda item simply is accept the report there is no recommendation so the committee cannot approve any recommendation they can simply give direction the staff to come back either to this committee or to go to the full council with a recommend with a particular type of recommendation so at this point the only thing the committee is doing is accepting the report without a recommendation and simply with the information that the chief has provided you great um it actually sounds like like it was cleared out without me saying a word so um i i wanted to to highlight something because I did want it to be very specific what we were doing and, and so I'll just I'll, I'll reiterate it but uh, I'll wait momentarily because I just wanted to, to, to speak my piece uh, for a second. Um, I think it's been very educational through this process to understand the the different systems on how we can support our firefighters and ultimately protect uh, the occupants of high rises and uh and what the capabilities and limitations are of those those different tools and um and i think we have some realities where we've got a lot of older high rises that don't have newer technology um but we also have uh, i think an opportunity to ensure that as we build moving forward we don't we don't go backwards we go forward and um and i think i've always sort of looked at it this way and i've mentioned it a couple times as we've had these discussions that I've looked at this as um, almost uh, an insurance policy where you, you sort of, you wanna, you wanna have the best. You wanna add to your, uh, your protections, your tools. Um, and, uh, and, if, and if there's something uh, better out there to help you, um, in my mind, I don't wanna limit that and take that away as a tool from our firefighters and from our community members. I, I'd, I'd like to have that included, especially considering um, the costs are actually not that significant, and it seems like uh, the additional costs that we may incur, there are grants for that. There's an opportunity to, to work with uh, professionals in the industry to, to ensure we can receive the ongoing training. And hopefully, quite frankly, um, 
you know, we can continue to see newer high rises as they're they're built include this, and maybe in the future, uh, the um, the you know proportions will be will be opposite, where we'll have many more of our newer high rises and buildings that have the the latest and greatest technology versus what we have today, and um, and and hopefully that continues to improve. And there's some other technologies that we can add to 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 increase safety in our high rises uh, again for both our firefighters and the community overall. Um, and appreciate, we, we wanted to, to ensure that our uh, firefighters local 230 had time to, to be able to, to, to look this over, vet it out completely. And so appreciate their input on this as well. Um, so uh, I will be supporting the motion. And then I just wanted to make it very clear. There was a, um, a presentation that came to us in August chief and, and essentially almost the same PowerPoint slide that you provided today but there was one slide different, and, and that's where I think the confusion has arised. The one slide different was a slide that actually provided a policy change recommendation um, that would have implemented a change to this policy allowing for uh, alternatives like the, the uh, elevators. And um, this current PowerPoint presentation, that slide has changed and where you have answered sort of the question on the trade-offs, um, and there is no policy recommendation. And so I think that's where maybe there's some some uh, just clarification needed that um, the, the motion that we have today is to accept the uh, report that you have provided uh, in the, the update today, uh, which would include no change to our policy and no recommendation to the council. Thus, you know, the job has been done. You've completed your work on this item and, and we move forward. Um, and just make that very, I wanted to make that very clear that that's what we're doing. Uh, and I think, again, our city manager's office and the city attorney's office have chimed in that, um, that that's, that's what's being done with the motion today. Uh, but for anybody that, that was you know, participating with us or that's viewing and, and views this later, uh, there are the, the prior documentations attached that show that there was a, a policy recommendation and that's not what's being accepted today. What is being accepted is the status quo. We're gonna accept the report and uh, not move anything else uh, forward. And just to clarify, Councilman Rodenas, that is what you intended, correct? I'll, I'll, I'll take a verbal answer. Yes, sir. <laughs> you nodded yes, but, and, and Vice Mayor Jones uh, is the seconder. Is that, was that, is that now clear, clear as an understanding? It's crystal clear and that was my intent as well. Okay. Great. Okay. So we have uh, a motion, a second. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised. Thank you again to the uh, members of our public. Thank you, Chief, for your work on this. And thank you to our uh, firefighters, Local 230. So if we can get a roll call vote, please. Perales. Aye. Jimenez. Aye. Mahan. Aye. Jones. Aye. Arenas. Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, that motion passed unanimously. And now we'll move forward in our agenda to item D2, which is our police department operations and performance bi-monthly status report. And uh, let's see who we, we have with us. We have Sergeant uh, Dan Krause. How are you doing, Dan? Good, sir. How are you today? Doing well, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Do you see my uh, pre presentation there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, letting me spend time with you today. Uh, I'm Sergeant Dan Krause with uh, Research and Development at the Police Department. Um, today, I'm going to be presenting the Police Department's bi-monthly operations performance status report. Today, we'll be covering citywide crime statistics First, I'll provide an overview of part one crimes, and then I'll provide uh, a sexual assault strategy update, including five-year history and an update to the city and county sexual assault work items. Other matters of interest, we have uh, Lieutenant Jaime Jimenez of the Sexual Assault Investigations Unit. He will be presenting on statistics broken down month to month and year to date. After Lieutenant Jimenez is complete with his uh, presentation. Um, I will come back on and uh, discuss the department's internal ranks and their demographics. And then finally, uh, I'd like to introduce the mobile crisis 
response team before moving on to any questions. As you can see here, these are the uh, part one UCR crime statistics. Uh, we have significant reductions in rapes and robberies. Uh, rapes are down uh, approximately 16%. Robberies are down approximately 12%. Uh, these contributed to a 4% drop in violent crime compared to the same period last year. When we look at property crimes down the bottom of the screen, we can see that larceny has a significant reduction of 15%. While vehicle thefts are up 15%, they're still down 1% compared to the five-year average. This, coupled with the 2% reduction in burglaries, contributed to a 5% drop in property crimes compared to the same time last year. We'll move on to the sexual assault strategy update. As you can see here, when we look at 2020, compared to the average of the four years prior, we see reductions in attempted sexual assault, rape, and penetration with a foreign object. Conversely, we see a slight increase of 4% in spousal rape and significant increases in domestic rape and domestic attempted sexual assault in 2020. As Lieutenant Donahue spoke to the city council on, uh, I'm sorry, in November, uh, this is likely attributable to the new intersectionality tool employed by officers in the field on every domestic violence incident. Overall, we have a 1% reduction in sexual assaults in 2020 compared to the average of the four years prior. These charts here show the current status of both city and county-wide work items. And if you look here, the uh, work items uh, under San Jose specific items, everything is categorized as either completed or in process, except for an, uh, increasing the quantity of sexual assault detectives by six detectives and one sergeant. Of course, uh, allocations of department personnel are determined by the department's deployment needs. And while this is still on the horizon, we do not yet have the staffing that would allow for additional uh, team being the uh, six detectives and one sergeant in SAIU. These are the countywide sexual assault work items. Again, everything is listed as either complete or in process, except for follow-up joint meeting between PISFIS and Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors regarding children, seniors, and families. Now I'd like to pass it off to Lieutenant Jaime Jimenez of the Sexual Assault Investigations Unit, and then I'll be back on in a few minutes. Hi, uh, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Jaime Jimenez. I'm a Lieutenant for San Jose PD. I'm uh, the new Lieutenant for SAU, although I've been in this assignment for about a year, but I'm new to PISPIS and I'm excited to be part of this team. Uh, today, we're gonna cover a few things. Uh, to begin with, we'll start with the month-to-month -month report of sexual assault data, looking for trends specifically. The second thing is sexual assault data for children 14 and under, um, specific to rape and child molest during COVID. And the last thing we'll cover is sexual assault data on repeat offenders and repeat addresses. As you all may know, we'll be back in March, um, one month from now, March 18th, for the sexual assault response and strategy annual report. And uh, the person who's going to be introducing all the data today is Angeli Montes. I know that most of you know who she is, but she is um, SAU's crime and intelligence analyst, Angeli. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me here to today to present on behalf of the department's sexual assault investigations unit. The following slides today are representative of data requested by the PISFIS committee. We begin with a generalized view of reported cases that involved a sexual assault offense for January 1st through December 31st, 2020. Notable factors in this bar graph include the 33.5% drop in reported cases from March through April of 2020, as opposed to 2019, where the change from March to April was a 4.3% drop. Then moving forward in 2020 from April through May, we see no change in the number of reported cases. Then from June through July, we see a 37% increase in cases involving some type of sexual assault Whereas in 2019, the change from June to July was 7.6% decline in cases. The rise and fall of reported cases in 2020 follows a similar rise and fall pattern of new COVID-19 cases in Santa Clara County. 
The same rise you see here from May to July parallels the rise in new COVID-19 cases, especially with the uptick from June 1st through July 15th as seen in the county's emergency operations center dashboard. This appears consistent with rates nationwide. In a report by Harvard Medical School Center for Primary Care published in May 2020, they reported that forensic nurse examiners in Washington, D.C. performed only 24 forensic exams in March of 2020, stating that this was a 43% decrease from March 2019. The article further states that the reason behind the decrease is multifaceted, but fear of going to the hospital is likely a contributor. Slide number 13 represents a count of sexual assault offenses committed. Remember here that some cases involve more than one sexual assault committed, and this graph is a reflection of that offense count, not cases. Here we see a similar pattern where there is a 38.8% drop in offenses categorized as rape and a 33.3% drop in offenses categorized as child molest from March to April 2020. Then from July, June through July, we see a 23.5% increase in the rape category and a 61.9% increase in the child molest category. Slide 14 gives you the count of where offenses were committed by categorized location. With the majority of cases, 63.5% being committed in a home or residence in 2020 followed by 9.4% of offenses having been committed at a park or unknown location, then by 8.6% in a street, road, or highway or alley, and 4.1% in a school or college. Slide 15 is an age summary and heat map of the total number of survivors aged 15 and up broken down by month for 2020. The highest concentration of numbers in the, are in the 15 through 17 year uh, age range, collectively making up 26% of the total survivors. Also note the same pattern where we see a drop from March through April and a rise from June to July in count of survivors. The next at-risk rate age range is the 18 to 24 young adult age range, collectively making up 19.4% of the total survivors. The count of survivors between the ages of 25 to 40 remain at an average count of 24, with 17 being the lowest count and 33 being the highest count. The average number of survivors aged 41 and up then declines from here. This slide is an age summary and heat map of those arrested or cited for cases involving a sexual assault offense. Note that the highest concentration is in the 25 to 30 age range with an average count of nine, followed by the 33 to 34 age range with an average of 10 and 38 to 40 age range with an average count of 12. This slide represents the ethnic breakdown of survivors in 2020. The largest concentration is in the Hispanic, Latin American or Mexican group making up 51.7% of the total number of survivors, followed by Caucasian with 20%, then African-American with 5%. It's really important to note that despite Asians being the ethnic majority in San Jose, collectively the sum of all Asians in this graph in this ethnic breakdown represents 12% of reported survivors, which still leads us back to the issue of underreporting in the Asian community of San Jose. This slide is the ethnic breakdown of those arrested or cited in 2020 with the high, with Hispanic, Latin American and Mexican group being highest in concentration, making 61% of the total number, followed by Caucasian with 15% and African American with 11%. Asians collectively make up 9%. The following next set of slides focuses on children 14 and under. Here we wanted to demonstrate the stark differences between 2019 and 2020 when it came to the number of offenses committed that fell in the child molest category. For May 2020, we see a 68% difference from May 2019 
in June 2020, we see a 69% difference from that of June 2019. In July 2020, we see a 35% difference from that of July 2019. Also notable here is that we would normally, what we would normally see in the summer months, normally we would see a spike in cases from May through July, as we see here in 2019. But in 2020, with COVID-19, May and June specifically are the lowest in compared to the rest of the 2020 year. Slide 21 represents the count of survivors aged 14 and under. We see the concentration being in the 13 and 14 year old age range, making up 22% of the total survivors aged 14 and under. This slide shows ethnicity breakdown of survivors aged 14 and under. The largest concentration being Hispanic, Latin American and Mexican making up 62% of survivors followed by Caucasian with 14%, and then African-American with 5%. Collectively, the Asian demographic make up 6.7% of the total survivors aged 14 and under. In terms of analyzing repeat offenders, there's currently no method available to measure whether or not an arrest or cited person is a repeat offender without deep diving into their history, history one by one. So with that, what I present here is a sample analysis of what I did for the last two months reflecting November and December of 2020, where I deep dive the history of each individual to show you a sample of whether or not offenders committing a sexual assault crime was a reoffender. 65.6% did have a prior history of offenses associated to either petty theft, possession of a controlled substance, burglary, battery, vandalism, trespassing, drug paraphernalia, driving without a license, resisting arrest, and or drunk in public. Then 34.4% did not have a prior history of offenses committed. Now I hand over the presentation back to Sergeant Kraus. Thank you, uh, Lieutenant Jimenez and Angeli. The department currently divides ethnicities into 18 different self-report categories to make the data more digestible. These categories were filtered into the six race data categories used by the US Office of Civil Rights. Uh, we did this because as an example, by using a more general category of quote Asian, we were able to consolidate Asian, Asian Indian, Chinese, Filipino, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, and other Asian, which are all separate categories used by personnel. The chart on your screen shows the demographics of the city of San Jose, note 35% Asian, 32% Hispanic or Latino, 26% white, 3% black or African American, and 4% other. This here shows the demographics of the department. We have, excuse me. Uh, as you can see, 12% of our department is female, which is consistent with the 2019 FBI uh, Uniform Crime Reporting uh, Report National Average of 12.8. I'd also like to note that 20% of our department is choosing not specified for ethnicity. 135 of those are officers and 80 are recruits. As a result, in the future, we expect to see an increase in this race neutral, not specified category. This here uh, shows the uh, gender and ethnicity of officers and recruits. There are 934 officers and recruits in our department represented as shown. This here is the same for sergeants. When we move through the ranks, you'll only see ethnicities that are represented uh, on, the, on the charts. For example, we do not have any self-reported American Indian or Alaskan 
native sergeants, so that category is not shown here. There are 168 sergeants in our department. Here are the lieutenants. There are 40 lieutenants in the department. There are nine captains in our department. And we bundled the chief of police, assistant chief, and the deputy chiefs together for this slide. There are six chiefs in our department represented as shown. Lastly, I'd like to uh, introduce the mobile crisis response team. This is a grant funded program uh, that puts specially trained officers in the field to participate and de-escalate events involving individuals suffering a mental health crisis. During this pilot period, we have one sergeant, two officers, two days a week, eight hours per day. The work days are based upon the staffing needs and budgeting. Uh, we are hoping a March shift change that we can increase that to two sergeants, eight officers every day and 10 hours per day. The primary limitation of moving on the program to this level is based upon staffing. Currently, Sergeant Mike Porter is permanently assigned to the MCRT. Officer James Chernilia is temporarily assigned to the program. Between the two of them, they are standing up the team, managing the budget, deploying personnel, and planning for the future, strengthening as we move into the next shift. Lieutenant Jimenez, Angeli, and I are available for questions. All right, thank you. And first we'll go over to our public uh, commenters. And if you're uh, joining us on Zoom, if you wanna use the raise hand feature, if you're calling in on the phone, you can hit star nine. Uh, to raise your hand and then star six to unmute. Uh, so first up, we'll have Paul Soto. Uh, good afternoon, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. God, I got so many questions and so many comments I wanna make. Um, I, I, it, it was really hard to hear these numbers and, and the lives of the people that are impacted by those numbers, especially with regard to the sexual assaults. I do have a question. Is there any distinction made between statutory rape with the with the girls on, between 15 and 17? Is there distinctions between statutory rape and other types of rape? That's question number one. Number two, I really, I mean, it was pretty obvious. The higher in rank, the wider in male it gets in the police department. These are the issues that we're talking about as a community, and that needs to be just directly addressed, just head on. Just let, let's have the talk. Let's sit down, have the talk. And then once we're done talking, let's really start finding actual, applicable, concrete solutions to really balance that. Because that was stark to me. And, I, and that is part of the problem in terms of higher ranking officers not checking the rank and file on these racist issues with regard to the Facebook, uh, uh, the Facebook uh, posts. You see, and, and we can correlate that because these are racist comments being made and the people that are in the top are white males. And when you really look at the violence around the United States, the next mass shooting that we have, I can give you a description of him. He's going to be an 18-year-old white kid with glasses that spent a bunch of time in, inside of a room playing video games. You know, and I don't mean to make a light of that, but I think we all know that what I just said is going to be true. That's the sad part. And so what I'd like to do is really start working with the city, the, the, the police department, and the county, and let's start getting con consensus and start dealing with some problems that we have internally. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have caller. The last four digits, 20, no, I'm sorry, 8794. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, being sure my Zoom connection could be okay, so I'm using my phone on this one. Thank you. Um, I guess a thank you again to the uh, to the candidate, police chief candidate meeting this past weekend. Uh, it was informative. Um, it was it was nice to learn uh, ideas of recruiting. That's important. That was uh, mentioned by a couple of people, a couple of the candidates, uh, Anthony Mata and um, Heather Randall. 
it was interesting. Uh, they they offered that, and I think they they have some good ideas in that department, and also the concept of uh, Anthony Mata brought up the idea of, of he wants to address uh, internal issues, and I felt that's that's an incredibly important issue that I think he can be uh, a very interesting person to work on that uh, for our future, and and. And the, the you know the the disparity of, of officers being uh, white male is pretty stunning. I didn't know it was that much, and uh, I think Anthony Mata could be a person to address that, and um, and to address you know overall uh, morale, hopefully. And uh, so good luck in your deciding. Uh, you, you know my feelings. I, I I learned a lot, and I and I learned to, I guess, just respect you know the each each candidate a bit more uh, after this meeting. I hope we can respect, continue to respect the ideas of reimagine and um, equity. I hope those concepts uh, can just grow, and we can just respect what they are attempting to work towards and notice when they're happening. I mean, they take many forms and, you know, how can, how can we look for new police, police, uh, higher ups, you know, and, and what is the transformative process? I mean, there is a wide balance and range that was discussed by in, uh, rules and up in government yesterday, what will be expected in the next few years? How do we bring that all together? How can all sides have a transformative part in this process of our future? Okay, and now we'll go back to the committee uh, and we have Councilmember Adenas. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the, the presentation. This is a presentation I've been looking forward to. Um, I think the last time you came um, was in November and I had a lot of questions back then. I continue to have questions and I'm gonna bring up two items that I asked for in November um, in the PISFIS uh, committee that weren't answered this time around. And one is, um, I wanted to know the location of the perpetrator and if the residence uh, was the same or the shared residence as the victim, as a survivor. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to, um, I also wanted to know how many calls were made from for, for um, maybe based on that survivor or that perpetrator. And I think it was, um, I think a repeat offender information was very helpful to see what else those uh, perpetrators are involved in. But um, the, the, the gist of my question was to see how many times has that police officer, when they respond to a call, how many times have they gone to that, um, to respond to that particular survivor? Because they may change locations, as we have seen in some of the data that you shared. It's not always in the residence. It could be a parking lot. It could be a hotel. It's important to know. Um, and part, part of what I brought up last year was that when our stakeholders met with us in the summer, they told us the severity of the injuries for sexual assault. Um, and intimate partner violence were, and child abuse were really on the increase. And uh, what normally would take maybe a year's worth of time or six year, uh, uh, months of time uh, to escalate um, in terms of violence, it, we were really seeing it um, in a really short turnaround. And we all know that the stress that this uh, shelter in place is creating and causing us, we, uh, Angelie, you showed some of the increases in when the, the strictest part or strictest times in uh, last year in terms of shelter in place, that's when you saw the hike up, right? In May and June, this one is some of those. Um, uh, and then there was a drop down. So some of the was lifted um, and that you could, you know, you could correlate that to the stress level in a household maybe being reduced as well, or the perpetrator being in that residence. We can correlate a lot of things, but I'm not gonna do that. What I really wanna know <clears throat> is, is that perpetrator living in the same residence? And, um, and I think it was Chief Tyndall who had shared with me that there was going to be, um, and that they were um, keeping track of a substandard housing study Oh, I think it was um, Lieutenant Donahue was going to um, follow it up, I think, is what was said last time. So I'm interested in learning about 
that that particular study, how um, the police department is going to interpret it um, and um, apply any of the learnings. Um, and so I think for an offline conversation, I'd like to follow up with those items. So um, I always look at this in terms of a picture. What is the picture telling us? What is the data points telling us? Paint a picture of what's happening out there. And so for me, I continue to see uh, two things. One is underreporting for all those subgroups that we uh, talked about, um, especially in the Asian um, uh, population that we know that we have a significant amount in our city. Um, and then the overrepresentation of Latina um, uh, children. And I'm gonna say children, even if they are under 18. Um, and so one of, the, one of the questions that I have is, um, why is it that you break up between zero through 14 and then 15 and up? Why do you break up the data that way? So I can, I think I can answer that and maybe Angeli, you can jump in as appropriate if you want. Um, uh, Council Member Rennes, thanks for the question. But I think the reason why we did it this time was it was our understanding that's what we were asked for was to do 14 and under and the impacts on COVID. So that's the uh, the direction we received and that's the reason why we did it this way. But um, you know, whatever, we're happy to do it in, in various formats, um, but we just follow the direction that we received, so. Um, I appreciate it, I'm so sorry that if, if it came from me. No, I absolutely, because this is what we learn in the joint meetings, but when, and I appreciate it because this is what I look for, but when you aggregate the whole picture, I'd love to see if we can, add, if we can include the zero through um, 14, um, when you look at the heat map of survivors, because we continue to break it down. And I think the numbers for me, you know, as I'm like, I'm looking at the trail of numbers and, uh, for example, on slides 15 for survivors, January through, um, December, 2020, the total is 1384, but then in the, in the race and ethnicity of survivors in slide 17, the total is 1914. Um, so, so I, I absolutely appreciate that. No, I, I thank you for, 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 no for complying with, with the request. And it's not to say that I had forgotten it. It's just that I think um, I'd like to see it also um, set aside and looked at, but also integrated into the whole picture because then we can really see um, zero through 14 um, and then 15 through 18, which is primarily the largest amount um, of uh, sexual assault, not necessarily rape, um, because rape is, is at a lower um, number. So I'd love to continue to see under 14 because that's, that is a focus, but I'd love to see if we could have, um, just like we do on page 15, we have an age summary. And so if you have an age summary, I'd love to have it continue to include um, the 14 and under. Right, and you know what, uh, we do have that and that should be coming out in March as well. So we'll have that to you hopefully next month. We're in draft form, but I'm assuming that it'll be part of our presentation. Thank you. Yes, because it, it, it kind of, um, it chops it up for me. I'd love to see like the whole picture Zero through, you know, unfortunately here we have 91, which is, you know, just terrible. Um, and then I love how you broke this up, um, zero through 14. So thank you so, 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 so very much. And I apologize if I if it came across as um, uh, you're uh, overlooking that request. Um, so thank you. One of the things that as I um, talk to our stakeholders, because this is part of what I need to do as as a council member. One, you know, I read the data or read the reports, and then second, I talk to some of the stakeholders. And one of the stakeholders that I continually speak to is Mary Ritter, and that's from the Center for Child Protection. And so, so she is in charge of the pediatric SART um, sexual assault um, exams at the Center for Child Protection, and she saw a very small number of child cases referred um, from our police department in 2020. So she um, counted 298 cases of child molestation for ch children 0 through 11 on slide 21, but there was only 36 cases of children to the Center for Child Protection in 2020. And so that is a very 
um, nominal amount of children. Um, and I, you know, one of her concerns with, was that, you know, 90% of those children aren't getting exams. Second is that, um, that there possibly is a, a, is a decision being made by the officer on site to not re-traumatize the child by having a SART exam, um, which we all know we, will benefit and is, is also um, a, a, a step in the right direction in terms of connecting that survivor and their family to um, uh, service providers, um, because it's not just a SART exam, there's also service providers that can, are connected. So would you, somebody, I'm not sure if it's you, Lieutenant, or uh, Sergeant Cross, whoever would like to speak on this, but um, could you share with me some, some, maybe some of the reasons why we have such a low referral? I can't speak to the data, so I, I'd have to talk to Mary about the data. Um, I, we did, though, meet with Mary and Dr. Sturm over uh, the last year, we've created an SOP that that is um, a situation where we we um, we heard what SOP. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm using vernacular. Uh, standard operating procedure. We we an internal policy to basically address how we handle um, pediatric SART referrals. Um, I recently reached out to Mary. I actually had a phone conversation with her. Um, so we're trying to streamline it. We're trying to be more. I don't know what the right word for it is, but we're trying to get more young children into her offices when appropriate so that they can have the things that you talked about, right? Um, my last conversation with her, uh, she actually told me that she appreciated it, that she was seeing an uptick in the amount of referrals specifically from San Jose Police Department. Um, so I'll have to reach out to her and find out, you know, if that's changed, but um, she has my number and we, we talked about it and, and uh, we actually created another person who's a point of contact for, for Mary Ritter so that she can call us if she has any concerns. So um, a council member, I'll reach out to her and I'll, I'll try to get data. That's something that we're trying to work on to get more data more consistently, but we do refer more children than we had previously. Um, so I hope that's that's a that's a positive thing, right? And I think we- No, ab absolutely. Any increase is, is a success. I'd love to see that be a lot more than this number that she gave me. And I'm only relying on her um, because we, in, in the absence of, of statistics or data on our on our end, and that would be my next question: is how can we keep track internally so that we don't rely on um, you know these uh, an external stakeholder to tell us, listen, we didn't get referrals. Although that's a really good uh, term uh, cross reference of of data sets, right? To see if um, hey, are they making it there? What, what is happening? Let's uh, continue to improve the system. Um, can we keep track of some of these referrals to the SART exams? Yes, we can. So I apologize if I cut you off. We can. No, no, no. And we're using, yeah, we're using internal measures. You know, we're doing the best we can with the systems that we have in place. And unfortunately, a lot of times we're using um, a system that can't easily extract that data. So we're using uh, spreadsheets and we're also using Anjali, who's great with the data to provide that. And we're also trying to develop systems where we share information between our partners, right? Where we're providing them information on a monthly basis and, and they are in return providing us information as well. So we can, like you said, cross-check our data, right? So um, the, the short answer is yes. And those are improvements that we're, we're seeking out to, to be able to report out better and to make sure at the end of the day that we're helping our, our survivors heal, right? And providing them the services that they deserve. Um, so yes, is the short answer. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, I'm going to skip my, um, you, you've all heard me. I'm not going to repeat myself again, but you, you know that this to me is a pipeline that we're creating in the same way um, the, the, that we see a gap in our educational system for our children of color um, and we create an achievement gap for them. We are also creating a gap um, here and a pipeline to other crimes because it, it's not me saying this, it's the data. The data shows us that if you have a sexual assault early on in your life, you have a higher propensity of uh, once again being sexually assaulted again or being in a, um, um, in a domestic violent uh, relationship or um, being a sex worker or being uh, a part of a human trafficking uh, um, business. Oh, sorry, I will call it a business crime. Um, 
And so for me, it is absolutely essential that we interrupt this pipeline. So however we, we need to do it, if we need to make sure that we include our, um, and we have uh, tighter controls on our data, or we have more uh, consistent meetings with our service providers to have um, real in-time um, um, response, because this is the other thing is we're always taking a look back. And we've taken a look back one too many years in my, in my um, opinion. Um, in the meantime, we have another cohort of, of Latinas, because it's primarily Latinas, Latina young girls who we've created a pipeline for other crimes. And so I'm not proud of this. I wanna make sure we interrupt it. And I also um, wanna make sure that the folks and the, survi the, the survivors that are not reporting because either we haven't created an outreach line that's appropriate for them as like our Asian subgroups, that we also work on that because those, those, those kiddos are absolutely suffering in silence um, and have no resolution um, it, as opposed to some of these survivors that come into our, our um, into uh, some of these systems and, and some of them, not saying all of them, but there's some that, that do benefit from uh, long-term um, support from our service providers that we have. So, I, that's really all I'm going to say about this. I, I could go on more. I have a whole a lot of notes on this because to me, it just paints this picture that breaks my heart. Absolutely breaks my heart. And, um, but what I, what I need to do is, is make sure that I continue to connect you all with the service providers and stakeholders that continue to tell me what they're seeing out there. And, um, and we've done a really good job of um, bringing housing resources to those folks um, who are in intimate partner violent um, relationships, um, bringing in digital devices and hotspots to those folks. And so I want to make sure that we we um, address this in a way that you have the resources that you need, um, because you know this is something that that our city needs to respond to. So the last, I, I know I said it was the last thing, but the very last thing I'm going to say is that we need to start thinking ahead instead of looking back at what is happening and think about when all of these more, uh, all this shelter in place is lifted or vaccination um, piece is, is you know, um, distributed or our schools are reopened, we know we're going to see these numbers rise. Um, and so what is our plan? How are we gonna to respond to this? Um, and I think it's a, I think for us as a city, we need to make sure that we have trainings for mandated reporters, um, especially for those who um, are outward facing um, workers um, or who are in the home like code enforcement or outreach specialists or recreation specialists um, and a really coordinated response with our county, um, our county uh, counterparts. Um, I'm really happy to, to share with you that we do have a joint meeting coming up so that we can have this uh, kind of conversation because we only hold one part of this whole continuum of, of the crime. And I know our county counterparts are responsible, uh, more responsible for these human services um, support, um, but it's our responsibility to coordinate. So uh, motion to approve. Thank you, we have a motion to approve the report. Second. second. And we have a second uh, from Vice Mayor Jones. And then uh, next up to speak is uh, Vice Mayor Jones. Excuse me, I'm so sorry, Chair. I, I'd just like to uh, get uh, some response from Jennifer in terms of what I'm requesting. I apologize. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I know the, the police department is planning to come back. And I think they've communicated with, you know, with, with more of this information for this next report and the, the annual report. And I see them nodding. So I think you can count on that, Council Member Arenas, to see that in the next month, the uh, PISBIS meeting, which I think is on the 18th of March. Wonderful. Okay. And um, in the inclusion of some of those uh, data or that information that I had asked for previously, Yes, I was I was including that as well. Perfect. But Thank you. I believe they made a commitment to that. Do you, can you confirm, uh, Lieutenant Jimenez? Yes, yeah, so I heard a few things, but we do already have the uh, the commitment for the uh, the underreporting in the Asian communities within our our, our plan in, in the next uh, 
we have all the data sets that go from zero to 14 and beyond 14. So it's going to be more of a complete data set than what, what you're seeing today is just a snapshot. So um, those things are definitely in there. And Angelie, do you have, you may have heard some things that I didn't hear, but angelie has been um, helping out with the data sets in the report as well. So feel free, Angelie, if you know of other questions that were, you know, but everything that I think we talked about are things that are already in the report, which should be submitted today if everything goes well. Absolutely, uh, Council Member Arenas, we will be following up on uh, much of the requests, including especially a location as requested and deep diving into the ages, especially children. Uh, we will be looking at sexual assault and rape um, committed against children or crimes against children, and that will include distribution of child pornography as well in that data set. So we will be going into a deep, deep dive uh, come March. And as in terms of residents and survivor, um, what I will try and work is also breaking down relationships so that you know known um, versus unknown offenders as well as familial to be able to give you a better understanding of, of the better picture and it will be in a five-year span as requested. Will you be able to um, uh, figure out whether they live in the same residence? In terms of living in the same residence, we don't have that capacity to be able to analyze that data. But what I will do is I will talk to our uh, crime analysis unit as well as our department to see if there are ways in which we can uh, deep dive a looking at the same residence. What looks like might happen will be more of a, a zip code and a location analysis for the survivors and then same for the arrested and cited and then what i can try and do is put together a breakdown um in terms of a smaller locale maybe that could uh give you a better understanding we can go from there thank you thank you okay thank you and uh vice mayor jones thank you chair first of all i thank council member arenas again for uh being a leader on this effort and bringing it to the forefront. Um, I heard a quote just recently that uh, stories are data with a soul. And obviously this is a story of, of despair and harm and anguish. And uh, it is heartbreaking. We're getting all this data and I wanna have a better understanding in terms of when we get to the point where it's actionable. And what I mean by that is, how do we interpret or take this data and have staff come back with recommendations, actionable recommendations in terms of policy or resources or anything else that we, we can act upon? So it kind of ties into uh, some of the direction that Council Member Arenas uh, was giving, but I want to be a little bit more granular and specific in terms of what kind of actionable things we can do. Right, so thank you, Vice Mayor, for the question. Um, there are some suggestions that are in there, they're in draft form, but they're definitely about how we can um, be more equitable and how we provide services in the different groups. Um, we know that there are potential groups that are underreporting, which does um, kind of skew the statistics and how things actually look. So that's one direction that we're looking into. We're also looking into education and how we can provide education at the younger ages, because we know that our, our survivors are essentially from 11 to 20 years old. That's where our, our, the core of our heat map suggests our survivors are. So how do we provide education so that these young adults don't become victims or survivors of sexual assault? Um, we also have other programs that include counseling and helping people heal. So when things bad things occur that they can um, get back on the road to success. Um, these are all things that the department supports and we support already through different um, funds. Um, but I think we can improve upon that. And those suggestions will come out in the uh, March PISPIS. Um, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, do you have any more questions? I don't know if I answered you. No, I, it, it, you answered the question. If they're gonna, if we're gonna see them in the March uh, PISPIS meeting, then that's what I would be looking for. And there, there'll be specific recommendations or there'll be high level recommendations or observations? I think they're in the moving forward category. Uh, they're already written down, but they're, um, they're, uh, they're, they're definitely items that are actionable and they're, they're, they're very specific. Like I said, it is in draft, so I don't wanna make any commitments because um, through the draft process, things may change, but uh, there are things that we have written in our, in our, uh, our memorandum that would, would provide uh, information to what we're talking about, about what can we do to make sure that we're 
we're curving and not just providing and reporting now about things historical that we can change things in the future. Great. Thank you. That's, that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I don't see any other hands raised from my colleagues. Um, got a couple comments and questions. So in regards to the uh, current discussion that we're having, I know we, we had the innovation uh, intervention training happening and that's been paused because of COVID. Uh, did we ever consider moving that to virtual? So let me just, uh, council member, let me just make sure I understand what you're saying. We're talking about the, uh, the updates on the, uh, do you have the page number? I'm gonna find it real quick. So we are virtual in a lot of things. Uh, the, the Vigilant Parent Initiative is virtual. We have other trains that are virtual. We're paused on one YWCA uh, general fund allotment. Um, the, the, the pause on that was because the information was proprietary and does not allow for the virtualness of the uh, education. So that was something that the YWCA is working through. They have provided virtual training to compensate for that pause. But the reality is that um, the, the people who own that that uh, educational program won't allow it to be conducted virtual. So I think that's what you're seeing in the uh, in the update. But um, that was the school the school age children, right? That was that that training. That's right. That was that was a training where it was, it was um, both the uh, high school age children and the middle school age children. Okay. Um, they had them both, but um, YWC did do a, a tremendous job in, in adjusting and working with, with what they had. But but that specific program had a pause for the. Uh, the proprietariness of the uh, the data. Okay, um, understood. And I'll echo uh, the vice mayor's comments and thank you, Councilmember Arenas, uh, for continuing to to highlight uh, these challenges. Um, I'm going to pass through uh, the question that came from Community Member Paul Soto on the data doesn't seem to parse out statutory rape. Where, where does that get included into the uh, the slides that you you showed of the of the data? I'll let Angelique talk about that because she's um, she has a stronger grasp of how data works. So in terms of addressing ages by survivor, um, that would be addressed in the survivor age summary breakdown, especially for 15 and up. If you were to look at uh, statutory rape ages, 15, 16, 17, or 16, 17, and 18, those ages in terms of survivors. And then um, if you look at the arrest age numbers, and I believe that was... Um, page 16 of the slides, uh, looking at there was only one 19 or three 19 year olds in the year of 2020 who were arrested uh, for a sexual assault offense. So just looking at that, but in terms of uh, offense breakdown, there really is no offense breakdown to, to address that. But unless you look at the rape category and the child molest category on slide 13. I'm sorry, I'm just looking it over right now as well in the slides. Okay, thank you. And so, um, so in, in uh, March, we will be deep diving on all of those offenses even further. This is the snapshot on page 13 in terms of the categories, and we just kind of put it together to give you a, a snapshot for 2020. Great, thank you. And now moving on, I want to see Sergeant Krause, if you can pull back up the, the slides. I'd like to go to the demographic slides, uh, starting with slide 27. Um, and so I appreciate this. This is something that I was interested in, in having brought forward, um, both from hearing from a number of our community members that were interested in what the demographics of uh, the, the the higher ranking officers were as we went up uh, the ranks, and and actually uh, concerns coming from internally um, from from officers having a, a sense that there was some disparities as we went up. So, uh, if you can go to the next slide, twenty eight. So. Um, the department overall, and obviously is, is, is matched nationally, there's a tremendous shortage of female officers. I think we know that we've had some, um, some dedicated efforts in recruiting um, there, uh, but certainly would like to see that uh, increase. But going over to the not specified, where is it that we're collecting this data? Is this upon 
hiring is that is that sort of the 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 catch point when we would collect this data of ethnicity and then beyond that that's it it's 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 not collected any other time or when is that collected council Palmer Perales is Gina Tabaldi here the acting deputy chief of the bureau administration and I oversee the academy uh, recruiting hiring so um when our recruits on day one fill out their HR paperwork they are given the option and that's when they specify. Um, and, you know, Academy 38, our class just gra that just graduated uh, two weeks ago, 87% of the recruits clicked or checked the box that said not specified. So, um, you know, there is a large margin of error and a lot of the younger recruits, I spoke to class 39 yesterday and they just said, you know what? That's just something that we don't need to disclose. Um, you know, they said it's our right and we don't necessarily have to disclose it. So um, while they're not disclosing it on the HR paperwork, I will say that we asked class 38, 39, and 40 just informally for race and breakdown. And if you look at the informal responses, um, I mean, in class 38, we had 17% women, we had 17% Asian American, we had 14% African American. So we are seeing diversity in numbers. They just choose on the HR paperwork not to specify it. And that is the only time that we would collect that data, right? So an officer has been on for 25 years. Are we going backwards to that data when I'm looking at this slide? No. And that's why um, you'll see if you look at the overall department, the not specified is 20%. And then you go to the officers and recruits, kind of like the younger generations, you see it go to not specified of 23%. So we're seeing the younger generations putting the not specified. I guess that doesn't answer it though. Still, I, I'm curious, is there another time where we collect that data or that's it? So for instance, an officer that's been on for 20 years, the only time we would have asked them for their ethnicity would have been when they were hired and, and that's it, we're not, we're, we don't ask any other time in their career. Correct, right? we don't go back and um, ask for it. Okay, so yeah, and that, that obviously makes sense as to why it's the younger generation of officers that are the ones that are, are more frequently not reporting that. Um, appreciate that. I, I would, you know, I think we, we've been at least touting it as the department on how diverse our, our last few academies have been, as you just pointed out. And so, Clearly, we collect that data, as you mentioned, informally at the moment in order for us to be able to, to highlight how diverse the academies are. I'd love to see if there's a way, because what, what I'll ask at the end of this is that this is something that we report back on uh, on an annual basis, at least for the time being. Um, so what I'd love to see is next year, for instance, we look at this data and um, if this is the formally, you know, the formal response from them on their HR document, is there you know, is there a way that we can drill down a little bit more on informal responses? Because as a department, we're, we're obviously using that informal information as we're going out and telling people how diverse our academies are. Um, but yet there's a not specified category, you know, category that they all fall, fall into, or the majority of them are falling into. So I'd like to see if that would be uh, the case and I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys kick it around before next year. I, I recognize we can't force somebody to tell us this. Um, so I'm not, not asking for that, but, but um, obviously, we're getting that information somehow when we're out there presenting it uh, informally or formally. And I would like us to think about, could there be, be, specifically maybe for this reporting information, could there be another time within an officer's career that we go back to, you know, to request this? And, and I think what I've been hearing, um, you know, again, is from more senior officers. And as a senior officer that's been in the department for, you know, whatever, 15, 20 something years, that feels as though um, you know they don't have uh, an equal opportunity for advancement. They may want their ethnicity to now be factored into the discussion versus when they were hired, they may have said, "Man, ah, who cares? And so um, I'd like to see if we couldn't consider that as, as well um, as you know, another, another time to, to be able to inquire about that. Um, and don't expect an, I don't expect the answer on that obviously right now and, and, um, and understand that, that that could be subject to uh, to regulations. If we can go to the next slide then. And so um, officers and recruits here on, on this slide, um, I think we, we recognize the, the process pretty, uh, pretty lengthy and difficult for, uh, and, and, and rightfully so. 
uh, to get hired by the police department to, to sort of make it in here. And I think um, we've done a real concerted effort on our recruiting. And I think that's where you see these numbers. And certainly that's where we see, you know, as we were just talking about in this 23% piece of the pie, if we were to actually have the data there, I think we'd see even more diversity as we know from the, um, from the informal information that we've gathered from our, our latest rec uh, recruit classes. And so I think that speaks highly to, to what we've done specifically to try and um, recruit and target uh, you know, a, a demographic that matches our community. And so I think this is, um, this is actually a, a you know, positive when you look at it in that way. If you can go to the next slide. So as you, you move to, to sergeants, I think one of the things that I'd like to see, as I uh, said, I'm gonna ask for this to come back yearly, I'd like for there to be a little denotation maybe on the bottom of the slides that, that sort of explains um, the process that one may get through to, to get to these different levels now. Uh, for a sergeant, it's a, uh, an essay, uh, a, a written exam, and an oral interview. Um, so sort of a three-step process. There's a number of other uh, requirements right on, on required readings and stuff like that, but, but I think those are the three basic steps. And, um, and that might, you know, demonstrate that, that there's, uh, you know, a, a real opportunity to, to give everybody a, an equal, you know, an equal opportunity to come in and, and have, um, you know, perform and, and complete a couple tests, uh, an essay, and, and then an oral interview. And, um, and at the same time, what we see, right, is, is from officers, and even from the other ranks, uh, at sergeant level, uh, is, is really the biggest difference where you see a, a tremendous increase in, in white males. Um, and so, well, uh, I think that the, the male category, just the females there drop, we don't necessarily know in regards to, um, you know, to, to how um, some of that with, that with that looks, but I think specifically, you know, you've got, um, you've got a real disparity there, I think. And, and so it's interesting that this one, this category has, you know, I think what might seem as though the most fairest chance for, for somebody to make it in, um, but yet you see some of the most disparity and, and I'll describe that momentarily so we can go to the next slide. So for lieutenants, it, it drops down to just my, uh, my understanding, right, is um, an, an oral interview and uh, a written test. So you don't have the essay. Um, all right, it's going to actually be the same, pretty much the same process as the sergeant's exam. Oh, so there is an essay? Correct. Okay, I never made it uh, anywhere past an officer. So uh, um, so that, that my understanding was it was those two. So it's, this would be then similar to the sergeant. Um, it would make sense that you would see more opportunity for white males to make it into the lieutenant position if they had to go through the sergeant position. And in the sergeant position, we saw the um, the big disparity, uh, you know, jump up to 55%. So I actually don't look at this disparity from sergeant to lieutenant as significantly as I do from officer to sergeant, because um, you're starting with already a bigger pool of, of white males that have an opportunity to make it up to that next rank. So I think um, for me, this is one of the areas that, you know, really looking at it, where might we have, uh, you know, create more opportunity for equity and it would be at that sergeant level, uh, and that could make a difference as you go all the way up, uh, and certainly as you go up to lieutenant. If you can go to the captain slide. So here, tell me if I'm right on this one, uh, Acting Deputy Chief. Uh, captains, my understanding is just an oral interview, is that correct? Um, we have an oral interview, and then we also do a writing portion. Okay, so the, the writing portion, is it an essay for each one? Yes. Okay. Uh, the captains do not have to take a written test, however. Okay, so that's the change. So it sounds like the essay or written portion is, um, or writing is consistent across, but but the written test is is not that gets dropped off at this level. Um, and so again, I wanted to see if that can be denoted, sort of just what how that changes as you go up, because I do think that factors in. And you know, I think what this slide may tell us is that even though from sergeants to lieutenants where the number is increasing in, in white males that clearly, um, right, there's, there's some, some level of consciousness that's, that's, or something, right, that is, that is factoring in uh, that 
drops that back down, whereas in my mind, it, it would either have remained uh, fairly high at 60% or more um, if it was following the same trajectory as the, the last two ranks. Uh, so I think there's something to be said there. And then lastly, if you can go to the, um, and the same thing could be said, sorry, for the female side of things where you can see the, just the, the huge increase uh, up to 22%. Um, again, starting with a smaller piece of the pie, that's much harder to, to, to increase as you go up. Um, and then lastly, uh, chief's assistant chief and, and deputy chief. Um, one of the things I wanted to note was this was as of 12, 2020. Did that include Eddie? It chief did. Person? Okay. Correct. So would, that, would the Hispanic Latino be, be one then if it were now, I guess? Currently, there are three chiefs that are are permanently in place and um, that would be one Hispanic or Latino. Okay, okay. Um, and yeah, obviously the, just the, the data as it was collected. Um, that's, that's another challenge. The higher you go up in rank, uh, the fewer numbers you have. And so looking at a pie graph is maybe not the best because as, as you're pointing out here, you're looking at one or two, one person changes, right? And it skews the, it, it changes the entire graph. And so um, I don't, necessarily want to get too hung up on you know on, on this these slides here because we're talking about such a small uh, percentage of individuals but what I do think is important to note is that um, number one at a deputy chief level I do believe now the what it is there is there's there's not even an oral interview right that's a direct appointment from the chief um, that is a direct appointment. If the chief chooses to do an informal interview or interview, I mean, that's at the will of the chief. Okay. It's a direct appointment of the chief. Whatever they may choose to add to that, they do, but it's a direct appointment of the chief. Correct. Okay. And so it's the same as that for, you know, next year's report, I'd like to see that just sort of denoted where it's, you know, it just shows the difference in how somebody may make it to a particular higher rank and how that does change, you know, as you go up the ranks, um, and um, and then again, maybe maybe we can uh, find a way to to look at these numbers uh, just a little clearer, so it doesn't strike somebody as, as such a difference uh, when we're talking about such small numbers. Um, but I, what I do want to hone in on is is as you're going up the ranks, I do think there is right clearly uh, it can be it can be concluded that, uh, you know, not only from when you enter with, with, uh, you know, 35% uh, officers uh, or recruits that are white males, which could even be less again, uh, maybe because of the not specified section, we don't necessarily know, but that's pretty high 23%. But that clearly, right, there's, there's no denying that there is indeed um, a, a disproportionately higher number of white males that will make it up the ranks. And um, what, what I'd like to do with the data eventually, right? Because I think it's one thing just to, to look at it and be able to, for some people, whoever was questioning it, if it's uh, community members outside of the police department or if it's um, police officers within the department, it would be looking at this, the same way that we looked at recruiting. And we, and we really had a concerted effort to identify how do we get a more diverse pool of, of, of applicants um, and, and then that way, hopefully that sh just in itself, right, changes the, the numbers. In my mind, it would be looking at what is it potentially that, um, you know, for, for instance, sergeants, as I said, that one has some of the most, right, steps. And as you point out to me, uh, lieutenant seems to match that. But, you know, if we can look at, well, what is it that may be causing some of these, um, you know, these numbers and for, you know, for sergeants, that first, that first promotional level, is there something we can do to be be supporting uh, women, to be supporting minorities, that uh, would help these numbers to become more equitable and 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 begin to match more, you know, the numbers not only of our officers and recruit recruits, but what we're seeing within just our community, but but at least at a bare minimum, what we're seeing with our officers and recruits. Um, and I think that first step is really the most important because beyond that, um, right, you're not going to make it to to the the deputy chief level um, unless you've, you've, you've made it to a sergeant. And so I think that's a really important step to look at. Um, I think additionally, once you get up to the deputy chief level, it is important to denote that at that point, sort of the, the you know, your, your performance on an oral interview or an essay or anything, it doesn't necessarily matter. 
And indeed, um, right, there are a number of other factors that, that we have to realize in that regard when it, it's up to a chief's discretion. And that, I think, is where, depending on who you have as your chief, um, certainly you're going to see different people get promoted at that level because um, it's simply at their discretion. And so um, there's, there's, you know, that, that's, that's, a, that's a choice that they have. Um, and that's influence that certainly the council or the, the city manager can have uh, to ensure that the chief is, is trying to have um, you know, more equity and, and diversity at the higher ranks. But I, I appreciate the, the data, the reports. Um, I, I will ask for the maker of the motion to, um, to see if you wouldn't mind including that this specific report um, come back annually and that it include uh, just some of the denotations um, and the considerations that I was asking for. Um, Chair Perales is Jennifer McGuire, Assistant City Manager. So um, if I may suggest, you know, we have our annual recruitment activities report and we may, and as you were speaking, I was really thinking about, we really, it's time for us to expand that report into maybe an annual recruitment and promotion report. So we can look at both of the recruitment of new people into it because we do talk about um, our demographics of our recruits and this would be a natural fit in there. And beyond that, we, as part of our police reforms efforts, we have a referral from council member Arenas and council member Sparza to um, have, and we have a work group that is working with the office of racial equity in the police department to um, look at producing internal policies that remove barriers and do exactly what you're saying to, to try, you know, to do, to, uh, uh, help with our promotions with you know, gender off and officers of color. And so we should be keeping track of that and being accountable to see if as we're moving forward, if we're making it, if we're making a difference in that work. And so I think, you know, we, we, we could come back as early as September and start folding into that report and just expand just to not talk about recruits, but talk about the, the department as a whole. I agree. I agree with that. Um, and acting deputy chief, would that would that sound fine to, to include that into the recruiting report annual report? I'm sure we could make that happen. Do we know when that when that time frame is? Yeah, it's September. September every year. It's usually about the time frame for the work plan. So it it would be you know in about eight months or so from now. So a little okay. bit, and then we then we can get on that cycle. Then and then look and see how we're moving as a department related to gender and ethnicity, not only by our recruits, but at, at looking at the promotions as well. Okay. Yeah, I, I would appreciate that. Ranks, I all ranks, you know? Yeah, I, I do think that's that's a, a good place to have it on an on an annual basis. Um, and appreciate that. If if uh, my last one comments are on uh, slide thirty five, if you can go to that one on the mobile crisis response team. Um, so I appreciate you including a slide on this. Um, it was uh, it, it was it was brief, um, Sergeant Kraus. Uh, and so I don't know what what was. I have a, a big interest in getting a full sort of update. In my I was going to have a request that this be one of the future items uh, of consideration that we have brought back to us. Um, and so I, I you know what I was hoping for was not in this presentation. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to, to sort of just go back and forth with some questions now. So what I'll ask is that this actually be agendized for a future PISFIS meeting as one of our uh, other items of, of interest. And what I'd like to get on this is I'd like to um, get an update on how the pilot has uh, been going since last year. I know that the police department made a splash um, in, in announcing that this would be um, adopted as a permanent uh, program or unit, and um, so kind of just a, an update on the, the the you know the pilot from last year, and then what it looks like moving forward with the new unit. One of the things specifically I'd like to ask though would be if we could have somebody from uh, the behavioral health services uh, uh, with the county, because I know that that's the the other component to this is one of it is having our officers and specialty trained officers that are that are you know part of this response team. But the pilot included uh, right, that partnership with behavioral health specialists. And uh, I'd like to see if we couldn't invite somebody from the county uh, behavioral health team to, to, to join us at that PISFIS meeting um, and, and be able to, to get a presentation maybe from um, yourself or Sergeant Porter and, and somebody from behavioral health, get an update on it, see what the future looks like. This is really exciting. This is 
I think, extremely needed uh, in our community. Uh, we need to be, you know, adapting and changing to the way that we're addressing and responding to uh, people having mental health crises. And we need to also uh, have uh, other uh, professionals that are that are out there and ready to uh, to do that as well. I've um, heard of, of programs similar to this across the nation that have been very successful. And uh, there's a, a couple sort of base models, one that includes officers and, and either behavioral health specialists riding with officers or, or uh, in our case, sort of responding, you know, adjoining them. Um, and there's others that uh, have those behavioral health specialists responding with, say, for instance, paramedics rather than fire, uh, rather than police officers, uh, paramedics or maybe firefighters. And, um, and my understanding is that there's, there's uh, data that shows that that's an even better response rate. Um, and, and if that's something that's working well in other cities uh, and, and can be you know, kind of folded into what we're doing, I think if we can have this team, but then additionally, if there's uh, behavioral health specialists and, and uh, other professionals that can respond to some of these calls that don't in the future even need a police response uh, would be the direction I'd like to, I'd like to see this go. Um, but that'll be my request for, for, for this to come back. And I'll ask the maker of the motion if, if, if uh, you're comfortable then just adding that as well, this will be another um, item of concern to, to come back. Absolutely. So um, um, add to my motion to um, bring back the mobile crisis response team updates on a uh, what basis, uh, Chair? Oh, this wouldn't be uh, repeating. This would just be um, uh, in, in our traditional sort of uh, every time we're, we're making other other requests for other matters of interest. Um, that's been something we've been doing now regularly. So I just, this this would just be once. It could just come okay. back, you know, over the next couple months um, to get that. Three that. months? Is it fair to, like in three months? I think we get these next? reports every two months, correct? Yes. Yeah, so I'm comfortable if you can bring it back in the next one. Uh, and if it okay. can't make it in that, then at least the, the, the following meeting. Hmm. Perfect. Uh, so, um, so the motion is to include the mobile crisis response team um, with an update in the next bi-monthly report. And, and this is actually included in here because Chief Tyndall, uh, ch acting uh, Chief Tyndall, uh, uh, committed to, to sharing some information on this. Uh, but I agree, we need to to have more than just this. Thank you for yeah. joining. No, thank you. Yeah, I was. Uh, I got a hold of the chief's office myself when the announce when I heard the announcements on the on the news because I uh, I was excited, but I was uh, surprised to learn about it over the news. So so I wanted to wanted to hear, learn a little bit more myself. Um, so uh, did you have any something else to add, Councilmember Dennis, as well? Yes, you know I had a, a something else uh, to add, and I know you uh, uh, really broke down some of the the statistics on the sergeant and lieutenant and you know, captain, how, how a captain becomes a captain and then uh, eventually a deputy chief. Um, and so I really appreciated you uh, allowing us to, to kind of venture down that way. Um, I, I know that the reason that this was in this report was because we wanted to make sure that there was enough females that could respond to um, these type of intimate partner violence or sexual assault, um, yeah, because that's Part of the feedback that we got from our joint response, our joint meetings with the county and, and our stakeholders, is that most survivors feel more comfortable with a woman. Um, and so I, I appreciate you you taking the time to really break this down. One of the questions that came up for me was, um, will will because we have this um, you know reimagining the police uh, community engagement process um, that that's going to get uh, going soon. Will we, at this point, put a pause on all of the folks who are in acting um, modalities at this point? I think right now we have individuals in acting capacity because our chief has not- No, that's a question for oh, Jennifer. Sorry. So yeah, we're not, we're not making any, until we get a, a chief in place, we're not making any permanent appointments on the deputy chief or the assistant chief role. In fact, right now we don't even have anybody in the assistant chief role. Right. We have allowed for um, for the police department to, because shift change is coming up in, in March, um, we have allowed for them to do some promotion so they can get into their, and have appropriate supervision. But uh, as you know, we're, we're hoping to make uh, an appointment for a chief, you know, in the next few weeks. Um, 
all goes well. Um, but uh, so, but we've only allowed at the at the lower levels, but we have not at the upper levels. So that's all. That's all in acting as as uh, acting chief and deputy chief. Well, when you say the lower levels, what do you mean? Sorry, captain sir. and below. Yeah, captain and below. I don't know if sure. I'm not sure that they did any for captain, but I know sergeant. Um, you didn't do any for captain, right? It was sergeant and lieutenant, is what I recall. Correct. Is that correct? Okay. So Gina just confirmed that for me. So they were there, and I'm not sure if they've completed that process, but they uh, they were pretty close to completing it last time, uh, last couple of weeks that I had uh, been talked to, to mm -hmm. acting chief Tyndall. But but as far as the uh, uh, so captain and above, are, there's no permanent appointments being made at this time. Uh, perfect. I know that my community um, all, always uh, um, wants to see themselves in the people who police them and who support them and who help them out when danger is in their homes or in their community. Um, and, you know, a lot of our Indian community uh, does not see themselves, although I've seen an increase visually. I don't know, you know, exactly what the numbers are. Um, and, of course, I, I'd love to see more Latinos um, in in a, uh, in a higher capacity, um, but I think you know, uh, Councilmember Carl has made it pretty evident in terms of how um, folks get appointed, um, and so I think there needs to be some discussion around that. Thank you. Those are my comments. Yeah, thank you. And um, and on that note, I'll just add: uh, anytime you have right, an acting uh, assistant chief and chief that's the same person. And you have people in in uh, roles that that uh, they're helping out in, like uh, acting acting deputy chief uh, Tabaldi here. Um, I know you're you're doing a lot um, to be able to hold down those roles in the meantime. So I just want to say thank you. We appreciate that. Um, and uh, I know we 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 you know, put you through even more efforts as you come to these committees to to put together the reports and and, and engage in the dialogue with us. So I just want to say I appreciate that. Uh, thank you, and, and to yourself as well, Lieutenant Jimenez uh, and Sergeant Kraus. Uh, and Angelie as well. Thank you for, uh, for for all your efforts. I think that's it for uh, this item. So we have a motion um, and just wanted to clarify with the seconder, you were comfortable with the, the two amendments that were made. I think the seconder was Vice Mayor Jones. Yes, yes I was. Great, thank you. Okay, if we can do a roll call vote, please. Perales? Aye. Jimenez? Yes. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Arenas? Aye. Thank you. Great, thank you. The motion passes unanimously. Now moves us on to item D3, our smart city roadmap, the safe city strategy status report. Um, and I believe we have uh, Rob Lloyd um, and uh, Ray, uh, Ray Reardon and yeah. Annie Smith. Uh, good afternoon, Chair. Can you see the presentation okay? Yes, we can. All right, uh, good afternoon, Chair Perales, committee members and members of the public. Rob Lloyd, CIO for the city. I'm here with Ray Reardon, our Director of um, Office of Emergency Management, <clears throat> as well as Andy Smith, our Interoperability Manager for the Police Department. And also wanna say thank you to Chief Sapien and Ryan Doolin of the Fire Department, as well as uh, Judy Trico from the Police Department who contributed to this report and the memo attached to the agenda. The report provides uh, the status of the city's safe city strategy and efforts. Uh, originally conceived in 2016, the ambition was to commit to a concerted public safety um, set of strategies and initiatives that address the safe city goal in the San Jose Smart City Vision, which was adopted unanimously by mayor and council in March of 2016. Um, and the city hired a FUSE fellow uh, to work across departments to build that safe city strategy. Uh, that was envisioned in 2016 and 2017. Unfortunately, that fellow departed before the work was delivered and the city encountered an inability to actually hire a qualified lead. So two things that were apparent from that process was that number one, public safety information and communications technologies constitute a specialized and, and rare and expensive skill to master and understanding the work across partners to create a public safety strategy is actually difficult. But number two, we couldn't wait. And after the 2017 flood and then um, subsequent disaster events, the staff actually shifted the technology coordination uh, to coordination between lead departments through the city's budget process and the priorities set through that process. So um, to put a point on it, um, absent a safe city strategy, 
um, and dedicated new funding, the departments actually set priorities to shape funding um, reviews and recommendations based on the wants that you see on this slide, which is better coordinated action across public safety departments, success via partnerships, both internal and external, um, a, a dire need to optimize resourcing because we've gone through some economic downturns uh, during those periods or, or some deficit years, and then also building for iteration so that we could improve. So from the priorities that you saw in the previous slide, uh, we came up with three um, themes and priorities that we used in that budget process. And so in the reviews of public safety technology budget requests, they centered on communications and interoperability, uh, operational effectiveness and disaster readiness and resilience. Uh, at the same time, uh, Office of Emergency Management actually moved into the city manager's office and began leading a new citywide and relentless level of readiness for the disaster response and recovery. So I want to show you the, the work that has been done um, kind of in a list format, uh, and then Ray will take you through a more of a time-based one. And the work that has been done has been foundational first and foremost, as well as impactful and informed by an unprecedented series of emergency and uh, disaster events. So if you think back to when we first conceived this, since then you had the 2017 floods, fires and public safety power shutoffs in 2019, a pandemic, civil unrest. So this um, active prioritization uh, process actually fit uh, kind of the timing of, of what we were looking at. And the coordination of safe city technology investments clearly paid off in the city's ability to communicate effectively and provide modern tools to first responders, uh, coordinate internally and externally in those disaster events, uh, use business intelligence, which you saw um, the fire department is using to make faster and more informed decisions. Uh, the EOC is using uh, pan, um, used a lot of these technologies in the pandemic to make better decisions, along with the training of staff in SEMS and NIMS for disaster management, uh, and the work with partners on, on project funding. So while the safe city strategy was displaced, the important thing to, to see is the staff continued to work towards common outcomes and making progress. And this speaks to the heightened prioritization efforts of the city manager's office, mayor and council, and how that helped us as departments make sure we aligned. Ray? Ray, I think you might be on mute. Yeah, I couldn't find the uh, button, I couldn't. Um, thank you, Rob. Yes, this is Ray Reardon, the director of the Office of Emergency Management. Um, as you see in this slide, it's a timeline spectrum which aligns with the memo. Uh, here's a quick journey through 14 major accomplishments and milestones from March 2020 on the left to the targeted future projects on the right. I'd like to point out some significant projects. In March 2020, the police department migrated from the old legacy radio system to the digital system to the radios in the Silicon Valley Regional Communications System, or as noted, SVRCS. In July 2020, the fire department did the same. The rollover required significant planning, preparation, training, and other efforts. During the year, we activated the alert SCC warning system three times for um, a civil unrest, for fires, and for floods. The new emergency operations center and fire training center uh, construction will begin with the groundbreaking ceremony in a few weeks on March 11th. And then finally, the first net citywide deployment is on schedule and expect a 97% completion in December of 21 with a target of 100% in May of 22. On to, uh, back to you, Rob. Andy? Oh, Andy, I'm sorry. All right, can everybody hear me? Yes. Very good. So I'm here to talk about FirstNet, um, and that is the um, exclusive public safety uh, broadband system that materialized in sept after, sept uh, after September 11th due to the after-action analysis and the communication breakdowns that took place uh, on multiple levels, both from a cellular network uh, standpoint as well as interoperable communications. So Congress committed uh, $46.5 billion to a public-private partnership with AT&T to ensure that public safety and first responders have an exclusive cellular broadband network. Uh, it's very similar to SVRCS, as um, Mr. Reardon explained. So the public safety radio communications is exclusive to us, as is now a cellular network. Um, Data is just as critical as voice as we use this system because each patrol car, fire apparatus, and command vehicle 
um, access computer-aided dispatch information in real time um, over the cellular networks that provides mission-critical data that routes emergency responders to incidents and returns critical data to the dispatch centers. So when the cellular network becomes congested in times of high demand, um, in and around a critical incident or disaster, FirstNet ensures that we do have the access uh, for both voice and data. Provides us good situational awareness and good information flow um, from the EOC and uh, our constituents. Uh, next slide, please. There's a little more detailed technical look at it. Basically, in the center of the screen is the PSAP or the 911 center, public safety answering point, and that's where everything originates. We dispatch our units uh, via the radio and provide data through the FirstNet network. This comes full loop back to the EOC and alerts and warnings to notify uh, the citizens and residents of the needs for evacuations or the needs for um, to avoid a certain area due to an emergency that is going on. So this is a, a full spectrum circle of uh, the ecosystem that we utilize from both the radio system, FirstNet's broadband, as well as um, information coming back from the citizens. Next slide, please. So FirstNet is, is more than just a fixed cellular network. They provide deployable assets that can fill in where damaged areas have compromised cellular coverage. Um, good examples are uh, during wildland fires where cell towers are taken out uh, and FirstNet can deploy, and they have a 14-hour delivery window, but they can deploy a number of assets, uh, particularly on the left is what's called a, a, a SAT Colt uh, cellular um, on a light truck, and they can bring that and provide both FirstNet and uh, AT&T commercial service uh, to a, an area. Also, they have a uh, tethered drone, which was utilized in the county search and rescue drill in 2019. It uh, reaches about 400 feet and put out about an eight mile uh, diameter cellular blanket that can be used again when the cellular system is down and out. They also have uh, deployed a blimp, and I think they use that in some of the uh, hurricanes and floods back east um, last summer. So this essentially will keep us connected and coordinated uh, during outages and or high congestion, such as the college playoff, college football playoffs. We had them evaluate the network and they brought out assets to help us ensure that we had communications during that event. Uh, next slide, please. So our goal is to not just put a first net phone in everyone's hand, but to also to put useful applications on it that we can uh, we can utilize for situational awareness as well as communication. One of them is the, the push to talk application that uh, turns the phone almost into a walkie talkie. The police department now has a digital evidence uh, collection application. So we can upload digital evidence from the field. Our department is using uh, Avenza, an offline mapping tool. When you're out of cell coverage, you can still navigate through GPS. And of course, the award winning San Jose 311. So we wanted to make sure that not only did we have connectivity, but we put tools in the hands of our first responders that could enhance our service delivery uh, throughout an emergency and, and even day to day. Back to you, Ray. Thanks, Sandy. So how does the FirstNet improve EOC operations? On January 26th and 27th, the city of San Jose was getting drenched by the incoming storm. The brunt of the atmospheric river provided much needed rain, but concern as well. The city deployed field inspection teams or fit teams to what we consider hot spots. The three hot spots included Ross Creek at Cherry Avenue. That's the bottom dot on the map. The middle dot is the Guadalupe River at Alma and not shown on the map is Penitentia Creek at Educational Park. The fit teams recorded water levels every 15 minutes into an app on their phone and took a picture. The data automatically uploaded to tables that, uh, that are presented in this dashboard 
in the left panel. The purple text is the date, the date and time stamp, along with the, the, the level of water at the Guadalupe and Ross Creek. The river uh, level is noted there, which we can compare to our flood tables that are help that help us determine the threat level that existed. The picture you see here is from the Guadalupe River at 2.45 in the morning, and it pops up, up when you click on the Guadalupe River a text in the left box. We also confirmed our monitoring information with Valley Water personnel via Zoom conference calls during the night. Next slide. So what you see here is with that hotspot data and flood maps, the EOC was able to identify evacuation and warning zones in these highlighted polygons. Staff were able to provide specific addresses to inform field employees who conducted door knocks in the pink zone and target for the alerting system in the orange zone. What once took nearly four hours two years ago took less than two hours this year. Identifying zones for warning, producing a message in three languages, printing flyers, door knocking and delivering the automated voice and text message. Three notification zones were activated at Ross Creek, Guadalupe and Penitentia. 2,500 contacts were made using the alert SCC system and or the reverse 911. The alert SCC system is an opt-in system. People are required to input their personal data for uh, notifications. Three zip codes received the Nixle notice. Nixle is an opt-in anonymous system where you text your zip code to 888 to 777 and you get messages right in that specific location. Three wireless emergency alert zones were sent. WIA, the acronym, is an opt-out system managed by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Unique to this event, the FEMA Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, or IPOS, experienced a partial noted network outage, and mobile telephone providers, Sprint, Verizon, and US Cellular did not receive and or distribute the WIA message. The failure was detected and corrected by FEMA within 11 hours of the onset. FEMA reported, uh, report stated that AT&T, T-Mobile, and other cell cellular providers did receive and distribute the message. This was verified by San Jose staff who were on site during the weather event. The iPods failure, while rare, helps further demonstrate the importance of a multi-layered approach to public alert and warning. The City of San Jose continues to utilize this methodology to notify as many affected people in as short as amount, uh, amount of time as possible while optimizing the resources. We continuously encourage the public to sign up with Alert SE so we can reach to them directly. We'd ask council to do the same when at public events, encourage residents and businesses to sign up for the Alert SEC system. Thank you, back over to you, Andy. All right, so not only on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, we have the we have better access to cellular networks than the general public. We also have a tool called Uplift, so we can take anyone, including extended primary, and take them to the highest priority um, on the cellular network to gain the best access. So this graph shows um, each of the priority levels, and we can, with a tool online in the portal, Uplift. Uh, anybody that uh, in any department that needs to that has a first net phone. Um, you know, why is this great? It's great because in times of tremendous cellular loads, public safety has now priority and preemption where we didn't have that two, three years ago. It ensures that we can provide some mission critical services and that we will have that access uh, when necessary. So one thing we wanted to do today was a, just a quick demo. I've got um, the first net uplift tool up and ready to go. So any of the members of the committee that happen to have a, a first net phone, I'm hoping that it uh, doesn't time out on me. Uh, you should get a text message. Uh, I just received mine that says that you've been uplifted, which means for the next, I believe eight hours is what I selected. Uh, anytime you try and make a phone call, um, you will have priority and preemption on the AT&T slash first net network. That that ends my report. Rob, back to you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, last slide, folks. Um, and so, looking forward, while not a safe city strategy, we are seeing some key themes in in the city roadmap and the city manager's enterprise priorities. 
You'll see these shape the initiatives and budget requests for the coming months. Um, and for public safety departments, the resources assigned will shape the success of these endeavors. Specifically, um, the three themes that we are seeing that, that um, are being most shaping are equity and public safety, planning and resource optimization, as well as disaster readiness and resilience and continued progress in that area. And with that uh, committee, um, we are here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. And we'll first go over to members of the public. And uh, if you'd like to speak, you can raise your hand. Or if you're on the phone, press star nine. We have uh, Blair Bakeman first. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, this was focused on, uh, you know, first net stuff and, and possible uh, natural disaster issues. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, in, in going to uh, 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 BA UASI meetings, you know, the past four or five years now, th this kind of uh, talk is common. And, you know, there would be lectures about inviting how can the everyday community be a part of this uh, network and a part of this emergency network and, and highway uh, in times of emergency? How can the everyday community have their own channel to communicate and to understand what's happening? Um, I, you know, I, I, it seems like the, that you're so much getting your process in place that I hope your next steps will be how exactly to now connect this, these things to everyday communities so they can get good information as, as events are happening. And um, I know that ham radio is making a big comeback right now, uh, but what about uh, using the, uh, the broadband airways themselves? And uh, not, not all people have ham radio experience. Um, you know, this speaks to, you know, what is going to be a possible tough upcoming decade for ourselves. And, uh, you know, we're gonna have a possible earthquake. We're gonna have a uh, sea level rise. We're gonna have uh, wildfire situations in the Bay Area uh, for the next five to 10 years. And, you know, what are we going to do uh, to address those things? How can we talk about the issues of reimagine and equity in, in those terms with those developments on the horizon? And, and how do we just make a really important focus on our open public policies, our green sustainability and, and equity and, re and reimagine. And uh, we can make those commitments and it, will, will, it is what will pull us through the difficult times. Thank you. There. And next up is Paul Soto. Uh, thank you, Paul Soto. I really appreciate you, Blair. Uh, in times like this, when it has to deal with technology, I really depend on Blair's input because he has such a such a clear grasp on the technological piece and how that informs public policy and how that impacts our lives. So I can't thank you enough, Blair, for the input that you give with respect to technology issues um, that the city faces. Um, my issue is with the uh, I'd like some talk around the infrastructure because you're going to have to build an infrastructure in order to support this type of system. You spoke about equity. What do you mean by that? I would like you to really articulate that concretely, what that means to you within the context of your specific discipline and how that spills over into the larger conversations of equity. And because from my definition with regard to technology, that would mean that this would be accessible to everybody, that it wouldn't be some type of uh, esoteric group that is the beneficiary of these technologies, especially since it's city money that's being used and allocated for it. With, I know that there's gonna be grant monies, and that's another thing. Grant monies, the deaths on, in, in let me see, the 38% of fatalities and 34% of severe injuries between 2015 and 2019 are located on 3% of San Jose's roadways. There's grants right now being put out to people just to do studies that have absolutely nothing to do with rectifying that. But what they're doing is they're using these numbers, and, and this is of, of, of my people, of Chicanos and, and Vietnamese on that side of town, in order to fortify their pockets just to do studies and have no concrete policy um, um, uh, requirements to put in place 
as a result of receiving that grant money. So I take great offense to that that in terms of equity being used in order to get this money. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll come back to our committee, uh, Councilmember Mahan. Thanks, Chair, and I'll be quick. I appreciate the report and, and all the effort here. I, I just wanted to reference something uh, in the memo. So I, I had the opportunity, thanks to Chief Sapien, to um, see the business intelligence tool that our fire department's using. And that was referenced in the memo. And I, I thought it was really impressive, I have to say. I thought the just the granularity of the real-time data, being able to pinpoint how a, a given um, you know, response times at a particular station, a particular shift, and really you know, have real-time data to inform operational um, optimization, essentially, uh, which I know is part of the, the vision here. And I was, I was just curious if that's, that same level of granularity, real-time data, the feedback loops, the ability to, to kind of dig in quickly and make adjustments, is that same investment being made? I, I just couldn't tell in the memo is that being made with police and, and other departments that are in this kind of continuous service deployment uh, position? Hello, uh, council member, Judy Tirico. I'm the Police Department Bureau of Technical Services Deputy Hi, Director. It's good to speak with you again. Uh, the, for the police department, we do have business intelligence reports and so forth that does give us part of our response times and does get into granularity. Um, the chiefs are gonna get the full presentation shortly uh, within the next week actually on the deployment. But our crime analysis unit does put out reports to the chiefs uh, on a quarterly basis that are reviewed as well. So it's the automation of all those reports for them. Great, and, and are you, I couldn't quite tell from your answer, that sounds good. Are you moving towards something more real time like, like I saw with fire? Yes, we absolutely have, it's more real time availability for them. Okay, okay, great. And is there, a, are there other functions within the city that are immediately relevant to a, I know we're not formally calling this a safe city strategy, but beyond police fire, I guess EOC, are there other areas where we're trying to beef up our real-time data analysis or analytics capabilities? That might be for Rob, I don't know. Um, yeah, council member, as part of the, um the city roadmap um, data and dashboards and that analytics piece is is on the table uh, it's going to be discussed more um, next week um, at the study session the okay. investment and how that's shaped is also going to go through the budget process and see what we can invest in but i know in the it strategic plan process departments have heard um, council and, and you very clearly that we need to get better about that data and continuous improvement and, and plotting to specific indicators uh, but the honest answer is there's more work to be done Okay, great. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Gl glad to hear though that's directionally where we're all heading. Appreciate it. I will, I think we want to move, uh, we want a motion here to accept the staff report. Is that right, Chair? That is correct. So moved. We have a motion. Second. We have a second. Thank you. Uh, I just had one piece and um, that was in regards to uh, the predictive policing solution, and I noticed that it says uh, the uh, procurement wasn't able to deliver on contracted, or the vendors uh, uh, selected, I believe, was able unable to deliver on contracted outcomes, uh, and the initiatives will be re-procured, and then that this is going to be on hold until the new police chief. I, I would, I actually think that's you know a, a, a positive thing. I think that that um, certainly is something the new chief should weigh in on. Um, and what I would ask is that as we direct the new chief to weigh in on that, that um, one of the things that we had not sort of asked for before, but that with that predictive policing solution that we really look at and ensure, uh, especially since, right, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a predictive model, right? It's a, a technological uh, solution, if you will. It's a robot, right? That's looking at these things, um, a computer. And so, uh, that we we are ensuring that we have an equity lens right in that regard when utilizing those predictive policing tools, um, and so I want to ensure that that is included in uh, in that as that gets directed to for the new chief to review. Thank you, Councilmember Perales. Yes, we have uh, definitely made sure that that would be one of the focus. Uh, our concern is not over policing, and it would be equitable. But absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, and that's it, I think. Uh, so we 
have a motion to second if we can get a roll call vote, please. Perales? Aye. Jimenez? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Arenas? Aye. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have uh, that passed unanimously. And now we'll go on to item D4, which is our second quarter financial reports for the fiscal year 2020 2021. And I believe we have uh, Julia here. Yes, sorry, I forgot to take myself off mute. <laughs> Most popular word of 2020 and 2021. Um, so with me today, Julia, I'm Julia Cooper. I'm the director of finance. And with me today, I have Chin Yu Sun and Nikolai Skarloff, who is running the slides um, to make the presentation. Before I start, I want to um, give a big shout out and a thank you to Chin Yu. Um, tomorrow's her last day with the city. Um, she has taken a job to be the director of finance for the city of San Bruno, just up to the north for us. So we're very excited for this new opportunity for her. And we're going to miss her terribly. She's done an amazing job managing our $2 billion portfolio during her time with the city. And she's also done an amazing job as being one of the two employee reps on the federated board. So we're really going to miss her technical expertise and her talent and her ingenuity and all the great things she's done for the city. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chinyu to give you her last quarterly presentation to the committee. Thank you, Julia. Thank you for your kind words. And it's been an honor and a pleasure working for the city of San Jose. I really appreciate all the opportunity and the trust the city manager has uh, has given me, allow me to do the do the do the job as I do today. And then it's been a dream coming true with the city of San Jose. Here, I would like to present the the investment management report for the second quarter of the fiscal year. Uh, next page, please. Um, well, okay, here we go. Uh, the city's investment policy conforms to the California Government Code Section 53600. Um, the city's policy authorized investment only authorized investment only include high grade fixed income securities. The long term uh, fixed income security need to be rated A or better. A short term rating has to be prime rate of A1, P1, or F1 or better. The policy is reviewed annually and it shall be adopted by the re by resolution of the city council. The investment pro program is audited semi annually for compliance purposes. Next slide, please. Um, the ob the objectives for the city's investment management is safety, liquidity, and yield in that in that order. Uh, the quarterly reports is are posted online and um, placed in the PIPS committee agenda and the separate agenda is for the city council to accept it. Next slide. Um, I'm going to skip this slide because we are going to have a separate presentation on investment policy. Um, here is a summary of the portfolio performance for the second quarter. The, the value of the portfolio as of December 31st was $1.85 billion. The earned interest yield for the quarter was 1.75%, and this is the annualized rate. So. And just to be mindful, uh, the weighted average date to maturity was uh, 723 days. Um, this fiscal year to date, the portfolio has earned the city about $18.3 million. There were no exceptions to the city's investment policy during this quarter. Uh, we do have a downgrade of the uh, of, one, of one credit, which we disclosed in the report. Um, Oh, I just want to mention here the downgrade happened to Disney. Uh, as we all know, all the uh, theme park has uh, suffered tremendously during the COVID era. So Disney was downgraded because of the loss of revenues. We are putting that uh, company on watch. We're staff are monitoring the credit quality of Disney as a company um, every day. Next slide, please. The city's portfolio is very well diversified. 
um, about 31% of the portfolio was invested in treasuries and agencies, and 9% of the portfolio was invested in supranationals. And another 9% of the portfolio was invested in agency-issued mortgage-backed securities, meaning those mortgage-backed securities are issued only by um, GS, uh, GSE, government-sponsored agencies, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. These are the agencies who will only buy. Um, this portfolio only also had about a 45% exposure to credit sectors, which includes CD, CP, um, municipal bonds and corporate notes. The remaining 6% of the portfolio was invested in asset-backed securities, uh, money market fund, and LEAF. Next slide, please. Uh, the city's portfolio is made of equities from many funds, general fund being one of that, held about $260 million as of December 31st, which uh, in percentage-wise is about 14% of the total portfolio. Next slide, please. And general funds balance decreased by $98 million during the quarter. Typically, general fund balance does decrease from the month of July to December. Um, the city tends to receive a little bit less revenue than expenditures then. Um, for the next six months, meaning January 2021 to June 2021, and the city anticipates about $1.5 billion in expenditures. Uh, the uh, estimated cash inflow between maturities and anticipa anticipated revenues um, total about $1.9 million, $1.9 billion. So we will have a sufficient amount of cash inflow to ca cover cash outflows. Next slide, please. Um, this is a chart showing the change of uh, equity balance of uh, you know five largest funds in the city uh, the red line indicates the general fund general fund peaked during the june um, in june 2020 when the city received uh, the red uh, the bulk of a uh, property tax also prior to that the city received the uh, the coronavirus money is about 178 million and then the property tax in June received was close to 200 million. So we saw an obvious peak in June 2020. And this sharp drop drop after June is because of the 360 million pre-funding of the city's contribution towards retirement, uh, retirement funds. So um, you can see the, the general fund balance is trending down, but we're expecting the balance to start to picking up from January 2021. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a, a chart comparing the city portfolio's performance with the two benchmarks. Uh, starting from um, early part of a 2029, uh, 2019, sorry, uh, we have seen interest rates uh, gradually uh, dropping, you know, consequently, the city's portfolio yield is decreasing gradually. However, I want to point out that the city's portfolio yield is decreasing at a much slower pace than the two benchmarks in, in the chart for comparison. As December, 20, uh, December 31st, the city's portfolio yield, which was the blue line as indicated in the chart, it was about over 100 basis points more, that's 1%, than LAIF, and 25 basis points more than Bank of America Merrill Lynch Index. Um, I want to say that this performance is a direct result of staff's disciplined approach towards the portfolio management. Um, as we uh, mentioned a bit earlier, the portfolio is very well diversified um, over 11 different asset classes. And then the, the investment maturities um, have been staggered um, in a five year term to match the city's cash flow needs. So I'm very pleased to say that the portfolio has a weathered uh, decreasing and low interest rate in low interest rate re re environment pretty well. Next slide, please. Um, going forward, staff will continue matching no expenditures with suitable investments within the 24-month horizon. 
We will extend a portion of the portfolio beyond two year terms when, appro when appropriate to provide income structure to the portfolio. We will maintain the diversification of the portfolio and we will focus on the mandate of safety, liquidity and yield. With that, I complete the report on the investment management report for the second quarter of this fiscal year. Back to you, Julia. Yeah, they, thank you, Chin Yu. So the rest of the presentation's in the packet if you have any questions on revenue management or debt management. So with that, we're available to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Chin Yu. Congratulations. Um, we'll now go to members of the public. We have Paul Soto. Uh, yes, thank you for that uh, presentation. Wow, it, it, it sounds like people in the, in terms of uh, having management control over the finances of the city, is 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 doing, uh, doing a really good job of ensuring that the, that the city remains solvent with respect to its in, uh, investments. The uh, in the memo I read about the uh, business tax. Uh, business tax relief with respect to COVID. Um, last year, we talked about the fact that the measurement for the tax responsibility of the businesses, is the, what the metric that's being used is the poverty level. And the poverty level is extracted from information from the 1970s. And so, so the, like their tax responsibility is actually not commiserate with what poverty actually is it's actually higher and so with with that said that you know I, I i totally sympathize with the businesses i understand in fact the city has been um very generous i mean in McHenry basically commandeered san pedro you're welcome dude you know you just basically took over the whole street you know and uh and and that was by intention I, that's factual um scott's bar and grill you know, there. One time, I was walking by there and having a discussion with the owner. That he, he was standing there with the owner, and he was like laughingly mocking the fact that he was taking up all that space right there in front of the uh, restaurant on some uh, Paseo de San Antonio, and uh, and like they, the way that he was thought very condescending and very very smug about the fact that he could do this because he's Scott's Bar and Grill. And I know the legacy of that restaurant. So I would just like to point out that we, I think that that needs another look with respect to the business tax. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll go to Blair Beacon. Hi, thanks for this item, Blair Beekman. Uh, good luck to the uh, person from city staff, uh, I've heard San Bruno can have an interesting uh, multicultural dynamic. Uh, so good luck in, in your move. Um, you know, I guess this, this is, should be a time to try to mention a few ideas about, uh, you know, like kind of what Paul started with is, uh, I mean, just a thank you that as a city government, you have been able to keep us afloat the way you have during this time of COVID. I mean, the fact that we've pulled through the way we have is, uh, is pretty remarkable in, in and of itself. And, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's in this times when you just uh, need to, I need to thank yourselves uh, for the, for the works, for the work and the efforts you, you've done and made. And now it's, ha you know, we're, we're starting new federal funding ideas, state funding ideas, and from a Democratic Party perspective, that should be open and inclusive to ideas and concepts, and hopefully they will be, and it won't be a big fight about it. And because uh, there are actually there are some very interesting Republican ideas to uh, address this uh, crisis. So it is important to you know the, the Republican Party is coming in with some fairly abstract ideas about how to address these. Uh, you know, the COVID situation. And I hope, you know, there can be partisan support for such a process and it ha doesn't have to be a fight and things don't get lost in that process. And, 
with I've got uh, 15 seconds, you know, and it's from that, you know, just an, a nice reminder that, you know, the good practices that government is trying to offer, I hope uh, owners and apartment owners and, and business owners of uh, tenants, they can, uh, you know, respect this and want to emulate it and trust what is possible in this work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Blair. Now we'll go back to my colleagues. Um, any questions or comments? Seeing none. Um, Move to approve. Second. And a second. And uh, if we can do a roll call vote, please. Perales. Aye. Jimenez. Jimenez. Looks like we lost him. Mahan. Councilmember Mahan. Looks like we lost Vice him. Mayor, too. Oh, no, no, he didn't. He's, <laughs> he's there, but he's just on mute. We'll see if he can jump in after. Sorry, go ahead. Vice Mayor Jones. Aye. Councilmember Arenas. Aye. We'll circle back to Council Member Mayhem. I'm here. I'm sorry. I. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we should note we did. Uh, it looks like Council Member Jimenez did drop off. Uh, I don't know if he lost service or something, but uh, we that did pass unanimously with the members present. So now we'll go on to item D5, uh, the City of San Jose Investment Policy Annual Review. Uh, same team. Yeah. Th thank you, um, Chair. Um, so we have a short presentation here on the annual review of the investment policy and Nikolai is going to pop up the slides. So each year the policy is required to be reviewed by staff and presented to the committee and then brought forward to the council for uh, approval. We've attached to the staff report a red line version of the policy so you can see where the actual changes will be made and it's uh, in your agenda packet. So um, in looking at uh, the investment policy, you may recall that, next slide, um, Nikolai, you may recall um, that we have the socially responsible investment goals, which are section uh, 22 of the policy, which says that those goals are to support safe and environmentally sound practices, support fair labor, support equality of rights, and pr promote community economic development. So in making investment decisions, um, we take those things into account. So um, you may recall last year when we brought forward the policy to council, the council gave us a referral to staff to return to look at that section. And the referral was to um, look at having a provision to have no new direct investments in entities that directly engage in the exploration, production, or refining, or marketing of fossil fuels. So um, part of the recommendations in the changes to the policy, which we outline on the next slide, are to amend that section to prohibit the direct investment. Um, we're additionally bringing forward a recommendation to increase our sector limit of municipal bonds from 20% to 30%. Um, <clears throat> as you saw in the earlier presentation, we're bumping up against that 20% limit. I believe it's about 18% right now. Municipal bonds, we only invest in maturities less than five years, and there are more municipalities are issuing taxable bonds, and it provides us an opportunity to diversify our portfolio and also pick up some yield. And then finally, <clears throat> earlier in the year, you approved a, a temporary uh, extension on the weighted average maturity. Um, to the end of June, and we're asking that that be extended through July of 2022, basically because of the low interest rates, we find ourselves sometimes a little bit out of policy compliance and just wanted to extend that from two years to two and a half years for another year. So um, the recommendation before you is to approve the changes to the policy and then refer it to the City Council for full adoption at their March 9th meeting. So with that, we're available for questions. Thank you very much. And so moved. Uh, we have a motion to approve. Second. And a second on the staff recommendation, Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here to try to offer some tough but honest words. Um, 
You know, it's my under, personal understanding that it's quite possible that are, are we looking at a, a possible rise in interest rates in the next few years? And if that's the case, what with your investing more in municipal bonds, what what is that actually would would that mean? Um, so, I, I I just put that out there. Um, you know, to conclude uh, my my previous thoughts, um, you know, it, it's an it's important that uh, you know not every that everyday people who are not involved with government they can understand what we're going through in this time of COVID, and not be fearful of it. I mean, we we are going to possibly be having, uh, you know, the next five to 10 years of, of, of serious natural disaster issues in the Bay Area. And, and those, those people need to be prepared how government is there to help and care and, and develop, you know, programs to help with needs. And how, how can apartment owners and, and, and business uh, landowners learn to integrate with that and work with that and understand that? It's important. I've always tried to come from a utilitarian position that we're in a time of emergency. And so, you know, it calls for some pretty serious measures. And I know that that, you know, can naturally go into a new system of, of money management and government. And that's fearful. And uh, I don't know what to say to that. It's just that, you know, there's a care that, that can take place and it's figuring out exactly what that care is. Maybe that's the most important thing. So no one is hurt by this process because someone tried to hurt us and it's important we work we work on how to uh to, to, to stop that and not allow that and that's that's the mo most important goal for ourselves i think and we can do that and those are the keys part of the keys to positive sustainability we are going to build our better future with positive sustainability that doesn't have to hurt people in the end and that's important we all learn how we can work towards that and what exactly can be the steps that can invite all of us to do that so good luck with this issue. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And we have uh, David. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. So I think we should build barriers between normal people and niggers so the niggers don't come and uh, kill okay. people, you know? Please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, as I was saying, uh, fuck niggers. And thanks for unmuting me. Okay, we'll have to be quicker on the draw next time. Um, and we have Lisa Hills. Hi, I just wanted to follow up by from the last comment and agree we should kill the niggers, gas the Jews, okay. kill the yeah. kikes, kill the faggots, kill the niggers, nigger, nigger. Thank you um unfortunate circumstances of zoom meetings um and obviously it doesn't need to be denoted but uh none of that will be tolerated and that's why we cut individuals off um so now we'll come back to my council colleagues um I don't see anybody with their hand raised and uh, we do have a motion and a second so uh, and uh, we can get a roll call vote, please. Perales? Aye. Jimenez? Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Arenas? Aye. So circling back to Jimenez? Yeah, he's not on Absent? anymore. Yeah, he's out. So, okay, thank you. So that passes unanimously with those present. Uh, we have our last item of the day, open forum. Um, we'll go ahead and go to uh, Blair Beekman, and I'll, I'll make a note that obviously if there's uh, any other commentary like what we heard, uh, we will be cutting people off um, immediately. Go ahead, Blair. Hi, uh, thank you. I mean, I just gave one of like my most heartfelt speeches I've ever given and uh, boy, it hurts that, that that should follow right after because it makes no sense. You know, it is just absolutely silly to talk that way. And I just, uh, I mean, I just poured my heart out and for them to offer something so ridiculous is just uh, ridiculous. So please don't 
talk that way uh, across these airwaves, what we're trying to accomplish here, if it's possible. Thank you. Um, please offer something constructive. Um, with this, um, to conclude, I wanted to mention uh, with the Vietnamese community and you know all the efforts that we were talking about yesterday at Rules and Open Government that um, you know the ideas of language interpretation and um, you know we have to think. I tried to say yesterday, think a bit more outside the box about uh, these issues and what can be ways our local government can can bring in language interpretation ideas. How can we ask people within local government to contribute to language interpretation? Uh, it's an important issue and it's being avoided and we're being forced to pay large sums of money to Zoom when we don't have to, I don't think. And uh, it, can, it can solve a lot of issues. And what I tried to also say yesterday is that I hope we can develop uh, clear notification practices for a four and 5G when it's delivered to local neighborhoods. Uh, you know, when the notices are delivered and they, they clearly spell out what uh, a person of a local neighborhood can expect and, and they can have time to uh, question and to appeal. And, and you know, I, I hope we're coordinating that as a city government and, and with the, help, the telecoms and we're all doing this together. That's our future of good community practices. Thank you. Thanks, Blair. Um, and our last speaker will be Paul Soto. Uh, uh, thank you, um, Blair. What you had to share, believe me, brother, it was not lost on me at all. In fact, the reason why I do what I do is because of you. One time I went to that rules meeting one time and I saw you picking up the, the memos and stuff and you were sitting there and you were reading them and I was hearing you very conscientious and, and really you know, immersed in the issues and articulating your positions on the issues and I was envious. And I also felt like ashamed. It's like, man, if this cat is up here and advocating for the city like that, you know what? I, I want to do the same thing too. I love my city too. And I want to be involved in the things in the context in which I exist in it. You know, and so my what I do was informed by the example that you had set. And so I, I just want to extend that to you. Secondly, Perales, uh, man, thank you for agendizing and suggesting to agendize that mobile unit issue. I cannot thank you enough for that. And 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 because you didn't have to do that, but in a way you did have to do that. You know, so I, I just want to let you know I appreciate that. And because there, there, we can really bring in the community on that issue, on that piece, and really work collaboratively. I would ask also if there could be a way to um, get some of the body cam data so that you can see and analyze the interactions between the officer and the person that they're servicing and like see the things that work rather than you know some you know real horrible incident you can see and analyze the data to see what works and and, and then try to you know build on that you know so i'm really really excited about that work with that unit and i have like i said um once that's agendized um, uh, Dr. Michael Ibarra, who is the director of the Muriel Wright Center, which is a crisis response team uh, slash residential treatment program, he's going to be sure to be on that call. I'm going to make sure that he's on that call. So uh, thank you. Thank you for a good meeting. All right. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned.